Nine present, no absent. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you, Pat. you please draw me in a Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United, the United States, States of America, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our first order of business this evening is reports of city officers, and the first being the comments by mayor. I do have one item that I'm very pleased to report this evening, and that is for a report and, uh, to recognize the fire department on their accreditation award. And for those in the public who are not aware of what that award entails, I just want to give a little background here. Is the Lake Forest Fire Department has received the accredited agency status with the Commission on Fire Accreditation International for meeting the criteria established through the CFIA's Voluntary Self-Assessment and Accreditation Program. The Lake Forest Fire Department is one of 148 agencies to achieve internationally accredited agency status with the CFAI and the Center for Public Safety Excellence. And in the regard to, I know this has been worked on for about three years now. Uh, former Battalion Chief Mike Freight worked on it. After he retired, the project was taken over by Lieutenant Mike Gallo and assisted by Deputy Chief Chris Garrison. And of course, our new chief, uh, Jeff Howell, has is, is taken it forward from there. And uh, I'll let uh, Jeff, if you want to give us a little more background to sure. the how it works and, and uh, really what you did. Mayor and members of City Council, uh, this was a commitment that was made to City Council three years ago, and uh, it was to uh, achieve international accreditation. It, it truly is probably the highest calling the fire service can obtain. Uh, the accreditation, um, what we did is we had to assign an accreditation manager, which was Battalion Chief Mike Frake. He did retire in November of 2009. This gentleman standing to the right of me then was given the opportunity to carry the torch. And, um, you know, he really did an incredible job. There was a lot of work that had to be done behind the scenes. We had to create a, a standard of cover, a risk hazard analysis, a strategic plan, all of these different documents plus our, our uh, policies and, um, and er everything combined. He did all on shift, and uh, you know when you when you look at all of the training that they normally have to do on top of all the other responsibilities, running calls, uh, this individual is very devoted to this process, and and he really should be commended for for what he did. You know when I look at the the accreditation model has ten categories to evaluate your performance that are broken down into 45 criterion, and over 240 performance indicators. The 10 categories broken down are governance and, and administration, assessment and planning, goals and objectives, financial resources, programs, physical resources, human resources, training and competency, essential resources, and external system relationships. I think it's important to talk about all of those and, and how um, they're so prevalent to this process because the rea reality is it took the fire department three years to, to get all of our documents in place, which is a tremendous amount of work. But the reality is this accreditation could not be obtained without the help and support of all the other city departments. When we were successful and went in front of the commission on August 26, we were blessed with uh, Mr. Kiley and Alderman Novitz's uh, presence, and uh, it was a unanimous vote. And you know, when you, when you reflect on what was done, some of the comments that they clearly had stated was, there's no way that this can be done if you didn't have an HR department that was at the level that it was. If you didn't have a finance department that was, was so good at what they did, the water plant, the police department, the dispatch center, all of these different entities, this is truly a, a combined effort, really from, from all of the city departments that made this possible. Mr. Mayor, if I could ask you to come down, we'd like to present you with the plaque. Where's Rosie? Where's the girl? Somebody had a camera phone? Camera phone? Got a camera phone? Get Rosie out of retirement. We need a camera phone. <laughs> Tom, don't you have a camera phone? I do. I there, do. you can get a picture. 
Tom will get a picture. We've got a camera phone. Here. Photographer slash alderman. Yeah. City employees can't afford those fancy cameras. <laughs> 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 It'll be on Facebook in 20 minutes. <laughs> I would do it. I don't know how to use mine yet. I got pictures on it. I just don't know what to do with them. Everyone. Put all the dead mayors in there. Squeeze in, though. See what it is. Like, you trying to do this on a camera phone? Good luck. <laughs> no, it's a great we have to go out to deer. We might need Rosie. <laughs> Rosie, take your oh, camera. I like the kneeling. The kneeling is good. Okay. If they're in church. One more. Good luck. Smile. Perfect. Just say fire. <laughs> Be on his Facebook page. <laughs> Who wants a copy? I'll send them out right now. <laughs> Only ten ninety nine. General fund. Well, Chief, as, as you know, and I think we've spoken before. I come from a long line of fire chiefs from the city of Chicago, and one uncle who was a state fire marshal. So I have a lot of respect for what you do, and I know the community does as well. And we thank you for all your hard work and efforts. Our next. Item this evening on the agenda is comments by city manager. Uh, Bob Kiley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. This evening we have uh, two guests with us. First is our Lake County board member, Susan Gravenhorst. Susan, you want to come forward and give the council an update of what's happening at the county level? I'd be very happy to. Greetings to all the councilmen and especially to Mayor Kelly. Welcome, Susan. I have just a few things to tell you about tonight. I've put at your desk the latest issue of our Horizons newsletter. I presume some of you get that at home as well, but if not, you have a copy tonight. And also a copy of a newsletter that I send out through the county to my constituents in my district, giving them a lot of information that they don't already have, and they seem to like that. I get lots of good comments about it, so that's working out well. I want to tell you that something exciting is happening in our district right now, right in our area. The new um, roundabout is going to, under construction now at the corner of River Woods and uh, Everett Road. Road. <laughs> <laughs> is it getting in everyone's way? No, the traffic's terrible. It is backed up. One of the well, it, was, it was very bad before. It was predicting all kinds of havoc. It's got kind of havoc now. Well, we're hoping to uh, mitigate the traffic with this new uh, process, which seems to work every well, well everywhere else, even in Paris, France. So uh, we're hoping that it will be ready for use after the first of the year. It was a little late getting under construction, but it won't be long. Time will go quickly and they'll be ready for you. So They need to get that done when Costco opens. <laughs> was, was it designed no, I mean, with really Costco? serious. They need really? to really put the push on it because there's going to be a lot of traffic when they have their opening, and it's really going to make a mess if they've got all those barricades and one lane and all the rest out plus there. Plus the bikers that ride plus, all on the all road the instead of on the bike path. Yeah. Oh, is that what, what gonna, they're doing? Yeah, what are they uh, going <laughs> to go around in a circle now? <laughs> I'll take a bet that Costco can build a 200,000 square foot building before we can build a roundabout. <laughs> they, <but>. they are. <laughs> they're, they're, they're putting the roof on theirs already, but I'm just saying. That I'll pass the word you along. You should pass that word along because <laughs> it's a disaster out there now. Since we've just paid our taxes, and that's behind us, we could discuss that for just a moment. Uh, you know that 7% of the tax money that you pay goes to the county, and the rest of it goes to a, quite a large number of other uh, taxing bodies who arrange their own list of priorities and, pre and present them to us. Uh, I think that one thing I really want you to know, and I think I've mentioned this to you before, is that uh, soon our budget time will be coming up and on the matter of the 2010 budget, uh, we, the county was able to uh, take down that number that was originally planned in the budget, and we, we, we really removed $6 million from that budget. We're very proud of that. And so it was, that was gone over thoroughly by staff, uh, members, workers there in the office, uh, people who were really interested and concerned and presented their ideas and so forth. So we're proud of that, and that has helped us to maintain our 
wonderful, uh, which we're very proud of, record of a uh, AAA rating, AAA bond rating, and uh, this mitigation of our taxes. So we'll start work now on the 2011 taxes. We'll be working on that until November when we approve the budget for that year. Uh, we'll be having to make a lot of tough decisions. You mentioned tough decisions a little while ago. We will be doing the same thing, and we are proud of the work that our staff does and uh, all employees in helping to, to come about with those ideas and helping us to come to the uh, conclusion. Uh, also, I wanted to mention to you that um, one of the main things that's coming up soon is that uh, the Lake County Department of Transportation has just sent to us their new book of plans for 10, 2010 through 2015. And that will include many important safety features, many important discussions of um, priorities. So we'll be working on that as well in the coming months. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention to you is that um, the Lake County uh, passage system is still in full effect. Remember we talked about that some time ago. It's doing very well. I wanted to make the point that it's not a, uh, a way of solving traffic problems, but rather a way of informing you of traffic problems so that you can avoid them when you're traveling. And we put, continue to put up more towers, uh, more uh, uh, features of the whole system and I think some of you probably were not on the council when we first introduced that, but uh, I think it's, it's a very great uh, asset and we're very proud of it. Um, one thing that happened just recently was on the 26th of August, which was a Thursday evening, I think, we held uh, another of our uh, Fort Sheridan Advisory Committee meetings at Gorton, and uh, I thought it was one of the best ones we've had because it was not a structured, so structured that there was a, a talk, uh, uh, um, speeches were given, that sort of thing. It was totally informal. It was an open house, actually. And renderings of the possible uh, use of, of the property were presented. People could just walk around, visit with commissioners, talk about them, get, present ideas, and we, we encouraged them to write their ideas on the renderings themselves if they wished. And so we're taking those in uh, to advice now, and. We're going over them. We're compiling a list of the priorities and suggestions that people gave. And at our next meeting, which will be next week on, I think it's Wednesday evening, the 15th at 6.30 at Gorton, we're going to go over those ideas that they presented. We're trying to move this along. You know, it's been going on for quite some time. And we want to come to the best possible conclusion. So uh, whether it should be a golf course or open space or combination is yet to be decided. But we're trying to cover all the possibilities and options. And we encourage invite all of you to come. It's an open meeting. We want everyone to be there to listen and to absorb what they, what they wish to absorb. Um, another thing I wanted to tell you tell about, too, is that we have a new building. I don't know if you've heard about our new permit facility over in Libertyville. You know, we have a campus in Libertyville that includes the Department of Transportation buildings, the uh, county sheriff's um, garage, uh, Winchester House, of course, and just behind Winchester House and property that we've had for some time is where the new permit facility is located. It's a lovely building, uh, terrific new architecture, and the total uh, icing on the cake is that the entire roof is greenery. And it's really a, a wonderful building. Besides that, it's very well planned, lots of input from the staff in, in doing so. That is where the uh, planning, building, and zoning committee operates, where the workers in that the staff in that department operate. And uh, it's, I wish you would come and visit sometime and just get a look at it because it's lovely looking and it's, it's so uh, conveniently and concisely planned and built. And uh, also another thing that will be happening there is in a few years the Discovery Museum will be moving into that building. I love the Discovery Museum as it is because it's kind of uh, quaint and, and interesting but it isn't appropriate for the items that are held there. That, Many, many of the archives are really in danger because you know, the uh, air conditioning and so forth is not sufficient for pres preserving things. So that's one of the features that we'll have in the uh, new building, the permit facility. But that's going to be two or three years until we have all the money together and so forth. We have a policy that we don't spend what we don't have. And then I think that's why we're able to do some of the things that we do because we're conserving money. We're sort of the opposite of Cook County, I think, if you want to look at it that way. How about the whole state? Yeah. 
So anyway, that's the permit facility. And then um, also, uh, I think you probably have heard that over in um, Gray's Lake, a new office of, or rather a new uh, uh, headquarters of FedEx is being built. And that's going to be another asset to the, uh, to the county because we're always trying to get, bring in new businesses, new ideas, and uh, new tax money. So that's going to be, I think, a very helpful thing. Uh, I want to tell you also that the Greenbelt uh, <coughs> uh, Cultural Center, which you know much about, I'm sure, because it's right here in town, or close to town, on Green Bay Road, just north of, uh, of uh, Lake Bluff, is going to uh, expand. That has been so successful in uh, conferences, wedding receptions, all sorts of activities that are held there, that we're adding on to the building, another building, and then we're also expanding because the one thing that we really need most is parking space. So we're building another parking lot across the street west on the west side of Green Bay, and that all will transpire within probably more than a year, but we're working on it now and plans are all set. So that's very exciting. So that's uh, coming up soon. And that's part of the Forest Preserve District. Uh, another thing that I wanted to point out to you is that in your um, horizons, I point this out, I know every time I come, but toward the back of the, of the magazine are suggestions of what's going on in the, in the Forest Preserve District during the coming quarter. And this is the fall issue. And there's so many interesting things coming up. If you have younger children, I think you'll enjoy the Halloween activities. Uh, there are going to be Friday night bonfires, uh, lots of interesting things that you would never do yourself, but you don't have far to drive out to Ryerson Woods and enjoy them. And I think you'll find that very interesting. We've had a wonderful sum summer in the Forest Preserve District. It's just been uh, so th exciting and things have been happening. Uh, our Tuesday night um, concerts, musical concerts at in Independence Grove, and people continue to enjoy Independence Grove more and more. I hope you're able to get out there once in a while. And the many other activities, we had the, uh, the Civil War reenactment again, and that was a ever more successful, bigger and bigger crowds. And so all these things are right here on your doorstep, and I'm hoping that you'll avail yourself of them. And please do look through these ideas of things to do, because I think also the Adlai Stevenson home is open now for tours. You can make reservations for a tour if you like on Sundays, uh, only I believe it is. So you might keep that in mind as well. So it's going to be a great fall, I think, in the Forest Preserve District, and certainly is for the county. Lots of things are happening. We're very proud of all the things that are happening, and we continue to hope to, to be successful and to do our very best for Lake County. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Susan. Susan. I appreciate you coming out this evening. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> appreciate it. Our next item is a spotlight on a local institution, one that we're all very familiar with, the Historical <coughs> Society, and someone who has graced our presence many times in the past, and we're glad to see her again this evening, Janice Hawk. Janice? Okay. Thank you, Bob, and uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Um, usually when I come to speak to you, I kind of look back and see if I can find some anecdote uh, to present. And I decided to look back 100 years to see you know, what was going on. And um, in 1909, the city revised ordinances. And I thought I'd give you a taste of what some of your predecessors were um, responsible for. You know, as you look around the pictures in the room, um, this was in addition to you know, making sure the roads were cleared and paved and um, working with the fire department, the police department, the schools. Um, you know, collecting the revenues. So these are some of the other items that uh, were part of the ordinances back then. That you were responsible for regulating the keeping and conveying of gunpowder and the use of candles and lights in barns, stables, and outhouses. You were responsible. Yeah. <laughs> we still have an ordinance. Um, you also had to regulate the weight <laughs> and quality of bread to be sold or used within the city. So I don't know how you would rate the quality of bread if the alderman had to taste them. I don't know. The taste of loaves of bread. We'll um, eat what's that? I said we'll eat anything. Oh. <laughs> Uh, you were to compel persons to fasten their horses or other animals attached to vehicles while standing or remaining in the streets. You also had to regulate, refrain, or prohibit the running at large of horses, cattle, swine, sheep, goats, and geese. 
and it was noted in the ordinance that if you did catch any of these wild animals, that you could sell them to pay for the cost of collecting them. We just updated that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also, you were responsible for prohibiting and re restraining the rolling of hoops, flying of kites, or any other amusements or practices tending to annoy persons passing on the streets or sidewalks, or uh, they fr frightened the horses. So keep that in mind. A little bit different atmosphere 100 years ago. But that's what we're all about at the Historical Society, keeping these stories and memories alive and you know, giving everyone the opportunity to go back and look and see what Lake Forest was like 10, 50, 100, or coming up 150 years ago. So I'll just tell you a little bit about the Lake Forest Lake Bluff Historical Society. We have almost 1,000 members, which is significantly higher than other historical societies of our size in our neighboring communities. Uh, we handle about 2,000 research requests a year. Those come in, you know, people come in person. We have phone, email requests. There are local, national, and even international um, uh, sources. We are close to 10,000 photographs, and that's several more thousand than, than uh, we had a few years ago when I came to talk. And um, within the next six months, we should have scanned almost all of those. So we hope one day to make those available online. Uh, we have about um, 1,500 maps and plats. Um, we were given 600 plat maps by the City of Lake Forest a few years ago, and those have all been indexed and cataloged. And we have over 2,000 other artifacts. So uh, lots of history within our walls. We are you know, doing our best to uh, care for them, and not just care for them and keep them in, in storage, but um, use them and make them available um, for researchers. Uh, we also have lots of information on homes and other structures in Lake Forest and Lake Bluff um, via some uh, address files that we have. We're a repository for the city of Lake Forest and the local townships. Um, we have a copy of the original charter. We have many township assessments, things like that, and lots of records that will be useful for this sesquicentennial. And we also are a repository for archival materials from numerous local organizations. One example is the Rotary Club that just celebrated their 50th anniversary, and they donated a bunch of materials to the Historical Society. Uh, we also have over 100 years of records of the Lake Forest Women's Club, and um, the library recently donated their copies of Country Life in America magazine, which the only other copy in the Chicago area is at the Art Institute. So it's a very, very significant holding. And uh, that's just some of the things that we do. Um, let me tell you also, um, coming up, we're very busy, um, as you can imagine, actively involved in the city's sesquicentennial. Um, we love anniversaries at the Historical Society, and uh, 150 is about as good as it gets. Um, so um, one of the things we did, we prepared a guide to sesquicentennial resources. We have that on our website and available for researchers or any groups that are looking into the sesquicentennial. Uh, we are working with the Sesquicentennial Committee on what we're calling the Lake Forest Legacy Project. And many people in the community, not just the Historical Society, are active in this, but it's an attempt to gather uh, the history of the community for the last 50 years. Uh, Edward R. Pease's book was written over 50 years ago, and we don't have a good documentation of what Lake Forest was like for the past 50 years, the, the recent past, the recent okay. history. And you'll be hearing more about that with the uh, sesquicentennial uh, committee. And we're also um, working with the sesquicentennial committee on putting an interactive timeline together for the sesquicentennial website. So we have a little mock-up here, a sample that, um, that uh, we will be working on. Our current exhibit is on the foundation for architecture and land architecture. Um, it's called Nature by Design, and this is just a fascinating um, topic. Um, this is a collaboration between uh, the Historical Society, Lake Forest College, and the Lake Forest Library. And the Foundation for Architecture and Landscape Architecture was a summer school held in Lake Forest in the 1920s and 1930s. And students um, in, uh, from different universities came to Lake Forest. Um, they stayed at Lake Forest College. 
and um, they had the chance to go around and sketch area estates. Many of you might recognize drawings like this that are um, matted and hung at the Lake Forest Library. Uh, what we did for this exhibit, we brought out these drawings um, that were in the archives at, La at Lake Forest College and they'd never been on display before. And it's just a fascinating uh, history. The, the, or the um, school was started by the Lake Forest Garden Club and um, students would sketch throughout the summer. They'd have speakers come, different architects would come speak and landscape architects. And then winners were selected at the end of the summer and the two winners got to go to Europe and sketch for a year. So um, it's really a lost art preparing these renderings and I encourage you to come over to the Historical Society and see it. And we have a program coming up on Sunday, September 19th. Um, we're calling it the Ecole de Beaux-Arts of Lake Forest, which is really what it was. It was an interdisciplinary school. And um, it will be held at the Lake Forest Library. The, uh, we will have a speaker come talk about the legacy of the Foundation for Architecture and Landscape Architecture. And it's free. So I encourage everyone to come by that day. Um, another architectural project we've been busy on, uh, we published a book on architect Walter Frazier who designed many homes here in Lake Forest and um, he was very important he's not well known like Howard Van Doren Shaw or David Adler but he worked um, in classical forms kind of at the beginning of the century all the way up to the international style um, this is the first book about this architect we now have the largest archives of his materials and I'm delighted to say that the book won an award from the American Association of Museums. So very prestigious award. Only a few book awards were given this year. And we'll be having a lecture um, in November by the authors Kim Coventry and Art Miller. And finally, I'm just thrilled, personally thrilled to tell you about our new signature event um, coming up. We are calling it Local Legends, and the inaugural uh, event will be an afternoon with um, Captain James Lovell and Bill Curtis. Um, Bill Curtis will be interviewing Captain Lovell, and um, it will be held at the Gordon Community Center on Saturday, October 30th. It's, um, we're hoping that a lot of um, younger people will come, maybe people that don't know about the Apollo program or, you know, have uh, never seen it. I'm sure many of us have never seen an astronaut before. So. Um, we're, we have you know, kind of a student ticket, we've, we've made it an afternoon event so that people can come and hear this wonderful interview and uh, see them on stage and um, then take, you know, finish out their evening. So um, I encourage you all, all of you to come to all of our programs. We have a busy fall and um, it's just you know, a pleasure to put all these on for the community. Thank you. Any questions? Jazz, for future reference, we got nine living legends right here in case you're looking for more material. So. Don't worry, we'll get to you all. <laughs> you won't get 50 bucks for us. <laughs> you never know. The programs, so. though, really are good, and I've seen a lot of them. They really are a nice asset to the community to have those. Well, thank you. Um, we have a, uh, just a lot of creative talent um, working hard for the historical societies. Thank you. I know just you're working hard on the 150th coming up. You got uh, a lot of people working on that effort right now, and it should be a lot of fun next year. Yeah, a lot of good ideas. People want to be involved, and it's great. And just note of appreciation: a couple Sundays ago, we wandered by with I went by with my daughter, and it was just curiosity about the estates of Lake Forest, Villa Turicum, Walden. What were their boundaries? What did they look like? Uh, the person that was there dropped everything, couldn't have been nicer, and it's uh, a part of the community I think few people appreciate have been to. It's a great place to visit, and uh, I, I just appreciate the pleasant Sunday. Well, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janice. I know that there have been a lot of questions in the last couple of days regarding Western Avenue, so I asked uh, Director of Public Works Tom Natz and uh, Assistant City Engineer Ramesh Kanaparetti to be here this evening to sort of brief the council and the community as where we are, how close we are to having this two-year project finally over, and any other updates. I'm happy to answer any questions the council members might have regarding the Western Avenue project.
Thank you, Bob. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, I, I got a few slides just to uh, go over where we are with Western, how far we have been, and uh, what to look forward to. Uh, again, the end is near, and uh, that is our, uh, our uh, game plan. Oops. Now it won't work. As you all know, the construction was you know, scheduled to be completed by July 31st. We were ready to be paved in the first week in July, and we gave ourselves three weeks for the granite paver crosswalks. Uh, again, with, with, when the strike hit us uh, late, uh, you know, early, in, early July, basically, what it does is like when you get a three-week strike in the middle of construction season, all the projects, again, all these contractors are working in different municipalities. All the projects get pushed off. Uh, being city of Chicago, you got only two seasons, construction and, and snow, so they all want to wrap up everything by October. So, you know, all the contractors are all, all the municipalities, state and local governments are all trying to get their projects done before that. So that, that you know, that particular labor union strike did put, put a, uh, you know, damper in our plans to get everything done. The work did resume in late July. Uh, we were going to have everything done, so week of August 16th, we got the paving work completed. Then the striping. Um, again, un un unknown to us, you know, one, one could not imagine that there's a chemical which is, you know, uh, not, not being manufactured anymore, and that particular chemical comes from a particular tree, and, and they're short on striping. So, again, all these factors are affecting on what we want to do, but at least we got the paving work done by August 15th, and the week of August 23rd, we started preparing for a crosswalk. We began our crosswalk installation on September 13th. We are hopeful that by end of next week is what we want to have all the crosswalks completed. Just to go over on, on granite paver crosswalks, I, I know that a lot of residents and the businesses uh, feel that when they come back, they go in the morning, they see the plates, they come back, and then they see the plates again. All the work which is going on is being going on underneath those plates. When we are working at the intersections, you got to understand when we have live traffic and we are working at the intersections, these things take time, and these are all labor intensive. First thing we do the excavation. We are doing that in the night time so that you know traffic is not disrupted. Once that uh, pavement is removed, that particular excavated area is then framed for concrete. Now concrete has to be poured in the morning because plants are open in the morning. Again, we do that with live traffic. Now you got fresh concrete and you got to make sure that it has been cured. So we got to put those plates back again. Again, all this work is being done at the intersection. Once the concrete is poured, we got to let it cure for three days. And once it's cured, then again, you do the same thing. You take it all out, and then the pavers are there, and then they start laying bricks. Again, one lane at a time, so that, again, the traffic is not closed. At no point did we close the traffic for long durations. Yes, it was closed during that particular installation, but for the most part, we were trying to do. And then we found out, you know, obviously, that with the deer path athlete. Our plan was to make sure that we do one intersection at a time so that we don't disrupt the, you know, the residents and the businesses. But with the Deer Path Art League, you know, we understood you know, that's their once, once a year event. So we, we decided to then do Westminster and Deer Path at the same time. And that's where the last three days, last week, was very hectic. And on Saturday around almost 5 o'clock, 4.30 is when we had the street sweeper sweep the whole thing, and it was ready for the art fair. And from what I heard, it was a beautiful two days, and they had a beautiful crowd. So uh, again, that, that, that's the game plan. I do have some pictures. Uh, to show just to uh, see how it looks in terms of uh, these, uh, these pavers. Say maybe we need a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> no, you really don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually. I was trying to direct traffic up there, but it was hard. 
Right. This is what we're talking about. Like all these crosswalks, as you can see, those are the metal plates, and then the the concrete bands been put on either side, and all the crosswalks are laid on concrete. We used to have crosswalks in Market Square, and over the years, if you don't have a solid base during the vehicle turning movements, they sift. And especially when we are trying to put it on Western Avenue, these bands will hold them in together and the base. And also, uh, these bands also act as a uh, for a safety too. All the crosswalks are to be striped. So they act as a dual purpose of serving, you know, they, they show that contrast between the pavement and the crosswalk. Uh, and that's, those are the, uh, you know, that's how the work is done. So they put the frames and then they take these frames out and then they start laying the bricks in this crosswalk. Again, every time we do any of the work under live traffic, they got to come pick these plates up. Concrete trucks have to be lined up here to pour the concrete. We got to put those plates back. So it, it is a tedious uh, work. But you know that's why we gave you know when we saw what we did at Market Square, so we gave ourselves three weeks to do this work. Uh, right now we are on that schedule to uh, to get it done. I'm sure there's a reason, Ramesh, that why wouldn't they have poured those bases when they did all the curb work and other concrete work? Tom, I think usually like you know for these crosswalks, for them to to start with the paver right at there and then leave a four inch gap and then start the paving work, then you're gonna have those, what we call is like after effects. So usually that's why they, they typically- cut it afterwards. They, yeah. Right, you pave it and then you cut it because that way you can exactly put it and you don't have to go back. It's very hard with those paving machines. Uh, that's why they just usually, typically they just do it this way. Uh, again, the, the end date work will continue. We hope by the end of this week, so by Friday, Deer Path is today is open completely. There's uh, all the pavers are in. Uh, they're going to start working on Illinois uh, tomorrow, and then by Friday we should be done with Illinois. And then we're going to excavate the three remaining crosswalks on Westminster and the one on Wisconsin. Uh, we hope to get the striping, whether it's permanent. Most the contractor is trying to see whatever striping materials he has on hand. He, he hopes to get the striping done Friday night. If he can't get the permanent striping, he's going to try to get the temp at least as uh, you know, Alderman Luby mentioned, to just get those parking spaces. So our plan is to work that Friday night, they're gonna do that, not during the business hours. And, and next week, again, continue with the, the game plan is to try to pour the concrete Thursday or Friday so that the weekend we can leave it for curing and then come next week early and put the pavers back. Uh, and then the, right now, the landscape, to get all the landscape done is that weekend of September 18th and 19th is what we're planning. Uh, that work is done by uh, City Forestry Department, so uh, they're looking at the plant availability and trying to get that work uh, during the weekend again, uh, trying not to inconvenience the businesses and the residents. Ramesh, I'd gotten uh, some feedback from some residents who were concerned, maybe a little disappointed with the, uh, what they saw as a lack of adequate uh, safety precautions in terms of horses or lights and alerts when there are uh, depressions and construction areas uh, have, have have you been satisfied with what the contractors have been doing on that right um, Alderman uh, Whitman our plan was to actually not have any of those gaps uh, uh, what happened was you know again uh, we had seven plates got stolen from the job site so what the, the again to keep the project moving what decided was we kept the edges as uh, as narrow as possible and try to get two lanes going. It was it was tight. I, I, you know we agree, but at least we tried to keep at least two lanes open at all times. And because of the shortage of the plates, and again when you get these heavy semi trailers and all going on these plates, you know these are these plates are buckling. So we had two plates which buckled. So we had to go and replace them. Uh, but our plan was not to actually you know make it all the way around, get the whole intersection pretty much covered with plates. But since we did lose some of those plates, and that's what happened, we had we had one one or two residents, you know, who had like you know, uh, with their cars to go in. But for the most part, you know, <laughs> knock on wood, it did work out, uh, work out uh, okay. Uh, nothing major uh, in terms of safety. I have a question, and that is, is the first pavers that were put in near the post office and by Southgate. Those have all twisted the same way that the early ones did, and we were supposed to be correcting that. Are we going to see those get straight? I mean, you know, the bricks are all over the place. Right. See, in Market Square, we had to use the original pavers. So all the pavers which are in Market Square Circle right. are all the original pavers which the Market Square, okay. which are usually four and a half inches thick. 
So because of the, uh, you know, as part of the focus group study, they, they wanted to use the same pavers. So we kept the same pavers. That's why you right. see the pavers on Western Avenue are different than the pavers on Market Yeah, they're Square. thinner. Yes, three and a half inches compared to four and a half inches. On are we going to correct the, I mean, they were put in crooked. I mean, it looks like somebody cross-eyed kind of. Uh, because they're, the, they're the, the, the lines between them weave. They weren't put in straight. Is that going to be corrected or? I think because the pavers are not like the ones where we have on Western Avenue, the new ones are all straight cut. The ones on Market Square, that's what, that was the original design was to not to have a symmetrical straight line. It's a rough the design cut. itself was like that. I understand it's not. It's not perfect, but it, it sways left and right. I mean, they, they bend. Right. I, I think that that was, again, that was part That's of That's part of the design. Right. But at least the good thing is, like, now you have the band on each side and the base so that you don't see those gaps and the shifting, what you had seen, you know, two years ago on Market Square, especially when the, they're trying to take those turns. Those things were moving much farther apart and making it in a safety hazard in terms for pedestrian and activity. To Alderman Luby's point, is that, are we going to be able to fix that in Market Square? I think th those are what, what those are original designs. So, yeah, those are going to stay the way they are. Bad design. Come on. They're, they're working at night a block from the lantern. What do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> Ramesh, just a safety question. Um, I took uh, the trip down Illinois several times going west, uh, and I, I, uh, I, I couldn't see the light. Right. It's and I, I almost landed in Mr. Luby's store. Yeah. Um, it's, it's blinding with the sun, and you just can't see it. So They're too I, I, high. It's too high. Right. And I think uh, Alderman Luby did bring that up. Typically, and I'm, I'm not going to go to engineering detail, but they, they look for a, the moment you approach the intersection, they, they have a 20 degree angle. But having said that, in this case, we have that. Uh, you have you know, a bridge. The, the overhead bridge. So yeah. we are going to take a look at it, and then we are testing the height of it to make sure that, uh, and we also had our cops also to take a look at it and see that if we can lower. So that, that's something it is under consideration. Alderman Hanrahan and the rest of the council, I would suggest that uh, if you see anything or get comments from any residents regarding any of the improvements along Western Avenue, let us know. Uh, there's always field changes and last minute adjustments and so forth. So just pass them on to the engineering staff and, and we'll take a look at them as they go forward. Will do. You, you have a walkthrough coming up as well. So if right. people have things right away, you should probably well, send an email to Ramesh and they can look at it through the walkthrough. Sure. One, one last comment, the, the cutouts at night, I almost ran my car in one of the cutouts because uh, uh, close to, again, the, the floor shop by uh, Chiefs in that area. If there aren't cars there, you don't know the cutouts there. It's really hard to see. Yeah, but now over the weekend, so since we removed all the plates by Market Square to get for the Deer Path Athlete, now all the edges have been pretty much covered with plates now. Okay. So now if you go by Illinois, the plates are there all the way to the end. Let me show you about the, the parking yeah, the lot parking cutouts. Parking lot so cutouts. Where the so concrete comes out the curbs. Yeah, I almost blew Some my of those tire may off. need to paint uh, yeah. yellow yeah, or something. Yellow. So, yellow. Like the, the striping so they can be seen with the reflective paint. Sure. Yeah, <clears> that's going to be part of the striping plan. Yeah. I'll drive over the plants. I'll drive over. <laughs> or put horses out on the. Yeah. <laughs> just for the time being. Yeah. Construction uh, projects. Update. Well, no, before you, uh, before you leave the podium. Um, can I ask you to, I like I think a lot of Lake Forest residents got in the mail in the last couple of weeks, the AT&T U-verse promotional material and then when people call they find out, well, no, it's not really there. Will you explain where we are in the awarding of permits for the uh, U-verse boxes and so forth? Right. AT&T uh, three years ago, uh, as part of, the, they used to call Project Lightspeed is what the term they use in their but it's U-verse as a commercial name. Uh, three years ago, they wanted to get pretty much the entire North Shore into this high-speed fiber, you know, providing up to uh, 12 to 32 m you know, uh, megabytes per second uh, video data capabilities. And uh, they, uh, Lake Forest had overall close to 30, 35 permits to be given uh, to install these boxes at various uh, strategic locations to provide this service to all the residents. Uh, as part of that mandate, they were able to do like 10 or 12 they went to those neighborhoods where there was a lot of demand, a lot of requests were asked of them, and, and they went and did those. And as part of this uh, mandate by the you know, state, also mandated them that they had to go to these low-income housing areas and get all of them also done by <coughs> end of this year. So AT&T in the last two years at least have shifted all their priorities to make sure that they make that as their priority because, again, 
there was not so much demand. If there was a demand or a petition from a particular neighbor or area, they were going to go there, but they, they didn't want to uh, get any fines from the state and the Fed. So that's where they've shifted all their priorities towards making sure that they comply with that particular part of the regulation. Uh, having said that, you know, when we talked to our, our AT&T rep, he said that if a particular neighborhood or a subdivision is interested in getting a U-Words, that they can petition and then they can, they can consider uh, putting installation. But uh, they were not saying that maybe after, after the end of this year, they may again look at their priorities and try to see where, where to go. But uh, for the most part, they want to focus on the, getting those low-income housing. We all done. Have we shown them our low income housing neighborhoods? Uh, <laughs> I think the west side, uh, you know, maybe it's in there. Really? I'm not sure. uh, just one question before you go. Uh, just has the state forgotten us on Green Bay Road? Is there a schedule on that? Yeah, all right. Uh, I just, I'll, I'll just go through a uh, few of the remaining projects to be. The Green Bay, again, as I said, you know, that, that strike did put a damper in all the contractors. So. Baker was scheduled to come today, but you know he's right now planning to show up tomorrow to start the grinding work on on Green Bay. Uh, the the first five to seven days is going to involve grinding the pavement, and then he's going to come back and put what we call is a first lift of asphalt, and then they have to adjust the structures. And then our uh, you know it, it's a heavy paving job, so our uh, you know hope is that you know to, to try to get it done by end of this month. Again, we don't want to go to November, but at least try to get everything done. They did shift some of their priorities because the school parking lot was one of them where they, you know, they put in their forces because the school was going to open. So they got that work done. And then, then they had to go to the other municipalities because they have commitment with others. So uh, their plan is to come with a grinder tomorrow, uh, try to get, you know, get the grinding done in the next four to five days, and then start with the paving right away. Uh, Which is with yeah. school schedules. School schedules, right. Again, we hope, again, Except during the grinding operations, for the most part, it, it should be you know like we did last year, Deer Path. Uh, during the grinding, when the grinding machine is there, uh, Green Bay Road being such a narrow road, uh, it'll be tight. But once they move with the grinding, it's it's they got trucks lined up, so usually typical, and then they got flaggers. So uh, we hope that once it moves, it should be moving very fast. Uh, Old Elm Road water main, uh, we got the water main in. We are reconnecting all the services, uh, individual house services, to the new water main. We got six remaining. Uh, it is our uh, hope, again, to get all the services done by end of next week and then grind it and then pave it. Again, that project is looking uh, maybe, again, by the end of the month to get it all done, paved, and, and good to go uh, on Old Down. Uh, concrete streets, uh, I just saw when I was coming here around 6 o'clock, which was a surprise that the state was working till 6, but uh, they were uh, working to get this thing done. So again, even that project, they're putting the concrete base on the, on the south side Again, middle of September, uh, that should be that should be done. Uh, see, in the concrete streets, uh, again, uh, most of the sidewalks throughout the town, uh, they were able to pull it. They are pouring this week. Uh, again, this particular area, we hope again, maybe by end of next week, that should complete. So those are the four major, and then we got the sewer lining, which was already done uh, throughout town, and uh, the seal coating was already done. Uh, so. <clears throat> All any questions on any of the construction projects? Again, I just say, particularly with Western Avenue, if you have any uh, thoughts or if you get any other comments like uh, Alderman Whitman, please share them with us as quickly as possible. We're going to be trying to button that up sh shortly. So, thanks, Commissioner. Thank you. I have just one other, or actually two other quick ones, Kathy, if you can put them up. I promise Ann Whipple that uh, this is a. Uh, uh, commercial announcement that this coming week is uh, homecoming for the high school on Friday, Saturday. So actually Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, Pep rally is Thursday. So there's all the relevant information uh, that's uh, coming up. And then the second one is also reminding everybody that there is a new state law and you can't use your cell phones in school zones. So we were talking earlier about generating some new revenues. Maybe uh, we start really uh, enforcing the use of cell phones. We could probably generate a lot of income here because a lot of people aren't even aware of this new law. And I've noticed a number of people driving through school zones talking on their phone, Just and that is prohibited. Chamber. So we've added a few driving, signs. You can't drive and talk, or students can't use the phones? 
you can't drive and talk in a school zone. Parents can't when they're picking up their kids nice. and so forth. Even if First you have a headset school. or anything? If you're on a headset that you okay. can uh, hands use that. Freeze, hands okay. freeze, hand freeze okay. you can. Somebody so be, uh, be very careful and just send out a reminder. And I think I we'll have a, a reminder article in the upcoming dialogue as well. We've put some signs up there, the high school. <laughs> In grade school have put some signs up there, but when I talk to people, people are oblivious to this new rule and regulation. So we wanted to make sure everybody's aware and of it. And this was just a state add-on that they decided to do? Correct. They don't know you can't pass a bus when the lights are red on the bus, too. But. Right. That's right, but people do that. So. Uh, and that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, yeah. Our next item on the agenda this evening is council committee reports. The first one being the Finance Committee, uh, Alderman Drumhouse. <coughs> Nothing new. Second one being the Housing Trust, Alderman Morsh. Um, can I give a quick on the Laurel and Western Avenue first you since that's not? Um, as the council knows, we authorized some additional uh, soil borings. Those have been completed. We don't have the final results back uh, for you, but we'll give those to you at the next meeting. Uh, and that may include some estimates for uh, potential cleanup to the extent that we, as you may recall, we did some additional borings to determine the extent of uh, contaminated materials on site. Um, in terms of housing trust, uh, I want to start by saying um, thank you for the last dialogue that we had. I thought it was a very good um, uh, dialogue. It was very informative. It was very helpful. Uh, to the Housing Trust. We did uh, what we uh, said we would do at the last meeting, which is we had a Housing Trust meeting. Uh, we compiled uh, basically four or five years worth of work in updating a, a Housing Trust plan, which was sent to you last week. Uh, it also includes a <coughs> substantial red line of the previous uh, plan, which I wanted to make sure everybody had that. Uh, it was the uh, first thing that we asked for in the Housing Trust. Um, and I think one of the things that uh, I wanted to just highlight about it is it is, it is really five or six years worth of work of um, both the Housing Trust and the City and the City Council um, uh, of thinking about and continuing to um, uh, develop a, a defined uh, affordable housing plan that's going to work for Lake Forest. And what the document in front of you is, is a draft, it's a draft document. Um, uh, you asked for that to come back and it contains uh, what I would characterize as the work as being a number of uh, everything from uh, symposiums with uh, people hosted them like the college. Um, we did uh, meetings with multiple communities that are involved in ho affordable housing. Uh, we invited in as part of uh, uh, certain developments over time. Uh, some of you were not members of council at the time, but maybe of other boards. But when Barrow was considered, for example, uh, we brought in uh, experts from the Metropolitan Planning Council uh, to help bring uh, best practices to Lake Forest and help think about if we were going to do and how we would do affordable housing incorporated into the FERA plan. Um, and in addition, I think uh, we talked to and had a number of meetings with uh, employers, uh, both we had, we had meetings out at uh, Conway Park, we had meetings with individual employers to hear their thoughts and ideas. So the plan is really a, a compilation of all those kinds of things, <coughs> tried, tried to put into one document for you uh, so that you can uh, see kind of where we are. Um, the document, I, there's a good cover memo that we put together. Uh, from Chairman Burns, which talks about what the plan is. Um, a lot of it is, or I would say 95% of it is material that has been presented and brought before council. Uh, in fact, there's a, a, a section I would highlight for you, section um, C on page uh, 18 of your packets, uh, which talks about uh, seven resolutions, ordinance, and actions that have guided uh, the policy over time. So this is I guess what I'm suggesting is this has tried to be a, a good, thorough uh, compilation of the uh, actions that the city has taken, that the policy decisions that the city has made, made over time. And it's meant to be a document that is today the document that uh, we would bring forth in October for your further uh, approval. 
Um, it would be, though, like the 2005 plan. It'd be a document that is really a living document. It's meant to, it's meant to continue to evolve over time. It's not meant to be static because I think uh, uh, certainly we have seen that economic uh, 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 changes occur, and we have seen that priorities with respect to uh, affordable housing uh, may change, and some of those are reflected in this document. So. Um, with that said, the purpose tonight is really to get your, any thoughts and ideas about any of the topics here is a draft plan. Uh, one thing I wanted to highlight when the Housing Trust met, we want to, um, one of the things that we want to do before our October meeting is we want to meet with the Senior Resource Commission and get their uh, input and thoughts as well on the plan. So we're not done getting everybody's thoughts, but uh, we wanted to come back with something in draft form uh, to you. Uh, that kind of highlights that. Um, a couple other things uh, quickly, uh, and Kathy, I don't know, are you there? Um, if you want to put up a, a couple of slides. Um, there are a series in the executive summary, summary there's a series of recommendations. Um, those were topics that we heard you talk about at the last meeting uh, that we wanted to uh, kind of tee up for the council. Um, one is that we would uh, direct the plan commission to uh, make sure and incorporate any uh, policy issues within the affordable housing plan to make sure those are properly accounted for and considered within the comprehensive plan. So for example, if we've identified an area where it makes sense, let's say the MS site at Laurel and Western where we would uh, ultimately do or try to achieve some affordable housing, that we include that in the comprehensive plan, so that's part of our plan documents, part of uh, part of what's codified here in the city. Uh, that was one recommendation. Uh, we'd also ask them to uh, look and see if the ordinance ought to apply for uh, to single-family uh, subdivisions. That's something we heard at the last meeting. There was some discussion uh, about that. That would be on a going-forward basis, so that if there were any subdivisions uh, that would come up, we'd ask the plan commission how would be a good way to. Uh, incorporate uh, affordable housing uh, objectives into that. Um, it would also look to, uh, and I think, Stu, this is a topic that you raise about how the use of the of, of payment LUA is made. And should we not be, you know, maybe making a little more stricter around uh, making sure units are included. So at Barra that we would rather than, well, I think one of the use, one of the examples that we talked about was Lake Forest Place, where there was a large payment in lieu of instead of building units there, and in fact, maybe that would have been a great place to have units that were on site. So, uh, we're going to ask the plan commission to look at that. It's um, you know those these are things that would ultimately, once we have plan commission input, that all come back to city council for your uh, review and approval. Uh, so it's not like we're, we're just trying to help point us in the right direction here with your uh, guidance. Um, we do have a demolition tax in which half of that goes to the affordable housing uh, fund. Maybe uh, Housing Trust ought to look at that topic as well as a possible uh, funding what, source. What is the thinking on that to change that? I, there isn't a thinking. I just think that we're looking at all possible funding mechanisms here. And if there's, uh, right now it's, it's, it's I believe, $10,000, Kathy. So $5,000 goes into the affordable trust fund and $5,000 goes to the city. <clears throat> and I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. 5000 goes into the affordable housing yeah, fund. Yeah. The other 5000 goes to support streets. Okay. Uh, the thinking is that through demolition activity, uh, there is an impact on city infrastructure. So that was the original thinking when that was put in place. Right. So what, what are we saying to change it? That we're not going to give it to infrastructure? We're going to give more to infrastructure and less to affordable? Or we're just looking at it? We're just looking at it to come back with recommendations to see if that makes sense. Okay. But not, none of this is conclusive. I think if you, as you see these recommendations, they're kind of saying these are topics that we heard you talk about or heard others talk about that need further looking. Um, and, uh, you know, I mentioned the Senior Resources Commission. I think it was really the consensus, uh, Chairman Burns and uh, Debbie Haddad, uh, the other commission members, that we really need to uh, make sure that we're connecting, although Marge, uh, is certainly at every one of our meetings, and March can certainly speak to the, I think, the interaction that we attempt to achieve uh, with the Senior Resource Commission. I think that there's a, 
Uh, I think there was a, a, a need expressed by uh, the committee members that we ought to make that a little more formal and, and, and get some more uh, deliberate uh, and direct input into the affordable housing plan because seniors is really a constituency that we feel very uh, strongly about that uh, needs need to be met and, and we need to be doing things to do that. So that's a summary of recommendations. Um, a couple other things that are in here that are um, that are new, I want to point out so that people can, um, if you could, Kathy, if you could put up the sites. Um, when I talked about the comprehensive plan, um, in this map, I know you've seen it many times, but we kind of wanted to bring it up one more time because one of the recommendations was is that we, we go give this to the plan commission and say, how should this be incorporated into the comprehensive plan of the city? So uh, we wanted to throw that up. This has been a, a, a map you've seen numerous times that we've presented in the housing uh, documents. It talks about all the various uh, sites that we have had discussion about um, affordable housing and where in fact we might do that. I can, I can go over them very quickly, but I think they'll be familiar to you. I mentioned the uh, MS site. I mentioned certainly the downtown area close to the train station, close to downtown. If in fact we ever redevelop parking lots or anything else in the downtown area, that that would be a very good place for that. Uh, we've talked about the partnership with Lake Forest College, that's here. We've talked about Barra College, that was an approved plan that was going ahead until that project um, uh, did not go forward. Uh, we've talked about the partnership at Lake Forest um, Hospital. Uh, we've talked about potential housing down at the Grove Cultural Campus. Uh, we've talked about Everett and Telegraph. Uh, and then we've talked about partnerships with Lake Forest Academy. So those are all the ones that have been kind of on the, on the docket a long time. And uh, we're recommending that that go to plan commission to see how they want to incorporate that kind of uh, discussion into the comprehensive plan. Um, I think I've done enough talking and it would be better if the council, if you've had any chance to review the plan, any things that were either omitted or were missing it completely. Oh, um, I, I, I just see one thing that, you know, and you said we'd want to put together a plan so that when we have a housing development that we include this affordable housing and some of those up there are possible. But when you look at uh, White Stable Vineyards, if that moves ahead, I don't think that that's one where it's gonna work. I mean, I, I don't think that you can turn around and put an ordinance that you have to include it on site. I think you make a big mistake. I think that there are areas with people that don't have an income to a certain level, they're not gonna be comfortable living there and they're not gonna be able to cover the costs of what it is. I mean, people come to Lake Forest and you know, we're not looking to put it on Lake Road uh, because they can't afford to live there. And I think we have to look at the reality that there are certain areas that it's not going to, it's just simply not going to work and blend in with the rest of the community that's there. I mean, we start talking about, you know, the, the hospital. Well, who are the people at the hospital that are really looking at the affordable housing? It's certainly not the doctors, and I'm going to tell you, it's not the nurses with what they make today. They wouldn't fit. You look at the college, it's not the professors, it's not the assistant professors, it's not the people in the administration. I mean, you really need to look and see, and in some cases, are, is that housing going to fit in all neighborhoods? And it's not, it's just simply not going to work. So I, I think you make a big mistake when you turn around and say, we need to put an ordinance together that every development have totally <clears throat> mixed use of houses. I, I just think you're going to end a lot of development right there. It'll never get even started on the paper. I, I think if uh, Mr. Smorthout was here, he would say, I don't think I can fit that. I don't think it's going to make it. So just something to take back and not generalize that this affordable housing is something that's going to fit everywhere in Lake Forest. Okay. Um, one of the things, I mean, maybe I heard it wrong at the last meeting, but what I understood at the last meeting is that council members asked that we might consider should this apply to subdivisions in the future? So it, it would not apply to white stable farms. Well, but I'm saying, you know, you're um, going to have some so that was the, that subdivisions was the in the way that they're so that done was, uh, that you're just not going to get a quality product or, or the 
product that's there with what the homeowners association costs are going to be, et cetera, it'll be too high I to mean, make it affordable. Those may be really excellent points. I think the only thing that we're recommending here is throw that question in front well, of I'm the plan look commission. At it, but and yeah. let them come back to city council if they have some recommendations in that regard. Uh, I, I don't think we have a foregone conclusion on it, whether yeah, that's the right thing or not. I, I appreciate John's comment, but there has to be some creativity on the part of people that are coming in with development. And the community right now, we're getting to a stage where in about five to ten years, we're going to be built out. But uh, developments like White Stable, possibly we could examine it. Uh, there could be rental units created for seniors with a little creativity the developers should have to come to the city to show why they shouldn't either we're going to tighten it up or we're not and if we allow windows of escape we're not going to achieve the goals that are the basis for what you've worked this hard on uh, the one focus that I think was omitted from the plan or overlooked and I think the plan is wonderful and the direction is wonderful but we also have a theme that's been overriding the last couple of council meetings, and that's the preservation of existing affordable housing. And one thing I thought that was being brought forth, there was a certain weakness on what we're going to do, uh, be it on zoning codes or uh, city policy, to keep the smaller housing stock as a policy. Are we going to keep it or are we going to allow it to change? And I think that's something that we have to examine as a community. Uh, have a, a little more solid policy on. Good thought. Kathy, where's the right place for that? Zoning board or plan commission? I think probably plan commission. Okay. I think that's a great add to the list here of, of topics. I, mean, I, I know that was a, <laughs> you know, a discussion that we had at the last meeting, so I think it's, it's worthy of uh, thinking about. Yeah, just to get much. direction for the community. Okay. Um, you know, I had a couple thoughts on this, Alderman Moore. First, we took out a lot of stats out of this that were in here previously. I don't know if those necessarily need to be in the document, but I would love to see what the stats look like, both in terms of what exactly is the existing housing stock. Um, we should have that breakdown somewhere, and I'd like to get a sense of it. And then secondly, you know, home values and, and where we're at and how they've increased. Obviously, they've fallen a lot in the last couple of years. And, um, to the extent we can get that information. Again, it doesn't necessarily have to be in this document, but I'd like to see it. Um, I, that's a good point, I, and I think uh, Alderman uh, Palmer raised that at the last meeting about getting more up-to-date data. And I, I think the idea of the appendix was to do that, to, to have that be a document that could always be updated and amended to the plan. So I think we could. Alderman Grumhouse, I think one of the things that was talked about at the uh, last housing trust meeting was actually formalizing that in like an annual report that yeah. the housing trust would give to the council each year so that as the data changes every year, you get more up-to-date information. Right. One area I continue to wrestle with a lot, and I know we talked about this at the last meeting, is who are we exactly targeting with this housing? Um, we've put a definition in here of affordable housing as specifically low and moderate income households. So if we take the rental requirements for low and moderate incomes, that implies um, family income of four of 45 to 60,000 a year if I'm using the 60 to 80 percent. Um, the issue I face with that is a lot of the people that we are targeting with this, we're going to miss. As Alderman Luby pointed out, you know, the doctors, the nurses, the school teachers, um, the professors, the assistant professors, um, you know, the police officers, the firemen, a lot of the city employees, we're, we're going to miss those people. They're not going to qualify under this. Um, when we talk about, um, you know, young people, we want young families and that type of thing, again, we're going to miss a lot of these people. And, you know, when we've talked about this in the past, I, I guess I've looked at this as being more bridge housing. It, it's sort of the housing that's not in the stock right now, but it's not down at that level. It's housing that, that, that um, you know, people can, that move, you know, we have a certain housing stock that's at a certain level, and then we're proposing this, which is a big level down. And, um, you know, certainly depending on the type of housing we're doing, you know, with some, some of these projects, the state or the feds, federal government is going to have 
you know, limitations, and if we decide to go with that, we're going to have to qualify for this. But the question is, if someone's doing a, a development, you know, if we do Barrett College, is this the, the level we want to target? Or are we happy if they put in housing stock that's, you know, $150,000 for a house or, you know, rents it, you know, for, or for income earners of, you know, 75 to 100, the households of 75 to 100,000. And, um, you know, I feel like that's something in the document that we've definitely gone to the side that this is going to be low and moderate as per the, the state definition or the Fed definition. Um, and I do wonder, for instance, in our affordable housing development, maybe we should take out that says low and moderate income households, or maybe just we say 30% of gross income. And in that way, we can, you know, think it's about on some think about on some of these projects whether we want to target, uh, you know, higher wage earners, um, the young families moving up that are right. going to hit that are going to be in the town a long time. Well, look in to the be executive there. summary, we talk about professionals, education, healthcare, public service. None of those fit. None of them fit. No. And this is the this is the thing that's moving the thing forward. This is the I right. mean I agree 100 percent with Alderman Gromos. This is the conflict. It's you know, and again, I realize in some projects, like if we look at you know at Settlers Green, clearly we're going to have to. That's the definition we're going to have to use. But again, as we look at bigger developments, you know, I question whether that's what we want to target, or is there a you know, and maybe we want to target some of that, but maybe we also want to let a developer put stuff um, that's in between that that again brings a, a, a benefit to the community and that it provides sort of a, a level of housing that we were very low on stock, but you know, that's the young family that we, mm -hmm. if we think about someone who can live here for 50 years, that's probably more the level they're gonna have to, to be at than, than at the you know, low yeah. definition. Yeah, how many I, families yeah. moved in and moved up over the years in this town? Mm -hmm. A lot. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a good point and I, I'd refer you to the appendix on page 31 of your document. And I, I think that's part, partly it's a drafting issue, which I think we can uh, address. But it's a, you're raising a good point because I, it's certainly not the intention uh, to be solely focused on that. In the case of Barra College, uh, for example, we had two tiers uh, because they were for sale units. And we actually had a tier, if you recall the discussion about Barra, we had, a, we had a discussion about a, a, a higher tier, frankly. It wasn't exactly affordable based on the definitions, but it was certainly more affordable than the balance of the units at, right. at Barrow. So I think you're making an excellent point. It was certainly not the intention of the Housing Trust to right. communicate that, so that's a good catch in this document that I think we gotta flush out. Okay. Which and page? Because you said 31, I bet. I think I go up to 17. Of your pack, pack of, of the, not the oh, oh, your agenda pack. 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 The, I'm sorry. The, the one other thing I would say, Alderman Morris, is, you know, I think we did sort of steer the housing trust to take a broader view of just than just seniors. Yes. I do worry that we've gone a little bit too far the other way. <laughs> um, you know, I still feel like seniors is the number one priority in my yeah. mind. Um, and, you know, I, I again, I feel like that Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily come across as well. It's certainly still a, a focus group here. But you know, when I look at um, the objective, uh, where was it? Um, Fifty-three local local preference groups. You know, we list Lake Forest residents, employees at Lake Forest Hospital, and Lake Forest College, and then employees with public and private schools and public service uh, employees. You know, we never say Lake Forest seniors. Um, and I just think that w we should be careful. Clearly, the seniors are still focused on, but you know, I think for a lot of us, that is still number one That's true. Um, mm -hmm. above everything else in terms of uh, where we feel. Um, they're the people, in my opinion, being most wronged by us not having a more diverse housing stock. So okay. those, and those it, are. And again, that was I, I agree, and I think the housing trust agreed. And one of the reasons that we felt before we came back to you again uh, that we ought to bring the whole plan before the senior resource commission and get their thoughts and ideas right. for that very reason. One last yeah. thing was yeah. the uh, you talk about this program that we're doing on the uh, neighborhood home without walls. Um, you know, it's the first time I've ever read about this. I, I don't know much about it, um, and so. You know, before we sort of recommend it, I'd really like to understand it and what exactly is going on and how it works and 
how it's being monitored and all, all that <coughs> all that type of stuff. Okay. I, I have some concern with the uh, the target, the idea of targets. These were set back, what, 2005? It was a different world. And they, they tend to take on a life of their own. I, I think we really need to re-examine them. And I'm a little concerned that this clause that was in the first, uh, the existing housing ordinance has been dropped. And it says, obviously, the city cannot control market forces that affect the affordability of land and housing within Lake Forest, nor the income levels of households that serve as the benchmark for determining affordability. This is particularly true <coughs> given the small size of the city in relation to the larger area against which it is measured for establishing affordable housing targets. Because of these unknowns, as well as the overall uncertainty of the real estate development industry and the changing regulatory environment in which such development occurs, it is not and cannot practically be a goal of this plan to meet the target levels of affordable housing units stated above in any specific time frame. I don't know why you'd want to drop that, but it seems to me if you drop that, you open up the door to saying, well, we have to meet these targets. And I'm not sure these targets are still realistic. I mean, this was years ago and it was a different world. So uh, I think that language ought to go back in so we don't get into a trap of thinking we have to meet targets. And I think we ought to realistically look at our targets again. I think as, as a follow-up for Alderman Palmer to your comments is that I think a lot of this, this is my comment to you, Alderman Morse, is that it appears a lot of this was taken out of those targets from um, non-home rural communities. We are a home rural community. We don't have to be subject to a lot of those definitions and targets, which is one of the difficulties I think that we fall under with the Settlers Green Project is that we're, we're, we're set, the limits there are very specific as to the income levels. They're very specific to the wage earners. The whole, the whole thing is all laid out and that is dictated by the federal tax credits that we would receive. And we're looking at a 30-year period, which is another an evolution of time which changes. So I would echo also Alderman uh, Crumhouse's comments that, uh, you know, I think there is no one-size-fits-all when you look at this because every community is, is different. Our community is different. Uh, and I think we have to be cognizant of that. and We have to be able to have a plan that can evolve and also can target the individuals at the certain points in time that that are in need of, of that type of housing. Obviously, seniors being the one that we're that we've always had a, a focus on. But then, what income levels are we looking at? And I think we have to be careful to not just kind of cut and paste uh, financial information based on federal regulations and plug them in here. Uh, I think we have to be much more uh, creative to cut out what is uh, really pertinent to our own community when we, when we devise this plan. Okay. Now, I'm still trying, I know I'm, I'm brand new to the, to the city council and things, but I don't, um, I, don't I, I just don't really understand, aside from the requirements of home rule or, or the ordinance that we passed to be relatively in compliance, the idea of affordable housing the idea of a deserving group of people. I mean, d diversity would make sense if we encourage the, financially the college to have housing, to have young college professors in our town and, and things like that. But to provide housing for a particular group of people in a super metropolitan area where, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a business owner. I have people that drive in from Delafield, Wisconsin, from Park Ridge, from, from you know, Vernon, lots from Vernon Hills and Antioch. and the idea that anybody that uh, um, that works at, at, at our company has any element of a right to be closer to work is would be laughed at in any business I've ever heard of. Um, and I just want to go on the record. I'm still trying to understand it. I'm not saying that it's that affordable housing is a bad idea. I just haven't gotten it yet. And I just wanted to say that because by not saying it, I, I don't want to be part of any momentum in a direction that I, I, I can't comprehend yet. I just wanted to air that out, so. Fair enough. I mean, I think um, just as, as broad comments, um, you know, over the last, you know, we've, we've gone through a lot of statistical information that's presented in front of council regarding income levels in our town. We've gone through looking at the housing stock and the availability of a housing stock 
to match those income levels, and we have, we have a gap. And that is, at a very high level, that is the statistical, empirical data that is driving and has driven uh, affordable housing ordinances here in Lake Forest over the course of the last seven or eight years. And it's been a very deliberate, direct uh, attempt to work through um, uh, coming up with a program that makes sense for Lake Forest, not for another town. We're not, in all due respect, Mayor, we're not cookie cutting anything. These are simple tables of, of uh, 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 area medium income. That's statistical information. It's not cookie cut. It's simply there for your reference. It's something that we look at in terms of deciding where income levels on that chart are from 30,000 to 90,000. Uh, we have, I don't know, maybe because I'm on the housing trust, I get an enormous amount of uh, phone calls from people that live in our community that are really very anxious about being able to stay in our community, to live here, especially seniors, and I'm getting numerous phone calls uh, from seniors about this. Uh, it's something that council's acted on uh, very consistently in the past, and what, I'm try what we're trying to do here is the housing trust, at your request, is update that policy to make sure it reflects today's uh, environment and your uh, concerns and issue. And I think you're, we're getting great feedback here. It's a process. We don't have to finish it on a certain date, but we want to just keep making sure the dialogue uh, goes forward. Aldermore, I, I just want to give you my two cents, and I, I wish I was still going to be on council to, to continue this. But um, I, um, I think where I'm coming from, and, and a lot of people that I hear from is, is I know you didn't grow up here. But there, there are a lot of people that, that are friends of mine that their parents uh, can't really stay here anymore. And they're valuable people to our community that I know you're looking at it in terms of the jobs. And I drive an hour and a half each way because I chose to because I wanted my kids to go to Lake Forest High School and the schools around here and live in this great community. Um, but I think we have to maybe, like David was saying, we are going a little bit too broad. Uh, but to concentrate again a little bit on the seniors and, and um, uh, Alderman Marsh is correct. I, I've gotten a lot of calls from uh, friends and family members of people that are, are great assets to this community that I would really like for them to stay. Well, so that, that, that has no, more I understand, mind. But I, my wife grew up here and, and my mother-in-law lives in town. And if I asked her if she would like some of her uh, town resources to be used to subsidize other seniors. Um, I mean, she's a, a very conservative person. It would, it would make her crazy to think that, that we were reallocating almost a redistribution kind of situation. I know it would, it would upset her, and, and, and she's from here. I'm from Michigan, and I've lived here about 20 years. But, um, you know, and, I, and I, I do understand that, but I still don't understand which one would get it? Which one wouldn't? How would you possibly manage something like this? Where would the equity be? Where would the, um, I'm wrestling with it. I'm not against it, but I just wanted to say that, it, that the light bulb hadn't gone off for me yet because I didn't want to be part of a something moving forward. That's, I just wanted to air that out. Is there any way that we can get from the assessor's office the value of some of the housing and really get a number? I mean. There's a lot of apartments up on Northwestern Avenue that are affordable housing. I had one lady call me and say, I live in affordable housing up there, and I don't want to subsidize anybody else, and if they can afford to move into my building, they can. I work in Grays Lake, and I like Lake Forest. And she chooses to be here and, and to pay that. Do we have, you know, we look at incomes, but are we looking at all at the value of some of the properties today for people to come in? And the survey said they want to buy a house, they want a garage, they want all these particular things. And we also need to make sure that in seniors that you're looking at individuals. I know we have a telegraph road, it's multi number of people. And so many of our seniors today, one or the other passes away, they're left with the house, it's too much by themselves. They want something small that they can be there. They're, they're, they don't need a lot of room and they're looking for something that's reasonable to live in. And I think we really need to have that included. And I think we really need to take a survey today with the markets that's changed and come up with the number of houses or what would be considered 
affordable for people to live in. I, I will tell you, the real estate end on the bottom, it's amazing. You know, three years ago, you couldn't see a house in, in Lake Forest for under eight or 900,000. There's a number of homes for sale today in the $300,000 range. And I really think we need to take a look at that and, and see that this it, that actually is affordable housing in the community for people to buy in and, and go. And we have to be careful. Kathy, we don't we do that interest. all the time. And I don't know what the statistics are. I think, you know, we did a survey after the last city council meeting because that was a question that got asked last week. I think there were 12 units or something like that under 300,000. I don't 000. know the numbers, but we can certainly update it, it's that It's something data. like that. Yeah. 12, but I mean, you know, affordable, the, affordable rentals, what, what are we... You know, no, do we know the very, number of apartments that we have? We we <laughs> we do have that number, yeah. um, and we will update it as yeah. part of this. Yeah, we do. Yeah. That should be, I think, thirteen oh one. If you look at that, there's a you know that's a fairly good sized building there. Right. Right. Yeah, and there there's where most of the units were. There were about and what? It, it does. Well, really I know, sad. but it's a, it's lower cost that people can buy into. Yeah. You know. It's, it's yeah, three hundred thousand dollars was the in two hundred thousand were the numbers there, and there were, uh, as I recall, six or seven units uh, that we looked at that were available. I mean, there's so re yes, there's there rentals is. there's rentals in thirteen oh one. I know there's a lot of rentals in there. Like people own them and run them out. And it's affordable housing. Okay. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not against seniors by any means, it, but I'm not again and I'm not against people in wheelchairs. But you. you you drive up to Home Depot and there's 80 handicap spots in front of Home Depot that are empty and somewhere, I just don't want to be making that mistake. I don't want to, you know, I don't think we need Braille on the cash station at the drive through I think these things are just kind of ludicrous when you think about uh, what's going on. I just don't want to step into some of those, some of those things. I don't know how practical some of these things are. I'm, so anyway. Okay. Um, I think that's good input. I think it, one last thing we wanted to do is just give you an idea of the schedule of future uh, topics of discussion on this. Um, we, we, will, we have uh, opportunity for public is coming up here in very shortly. So. Did you get a copy of it? Yes. Okay. You should have, it should be a, attached to the agenda. Yeah, I, heard, I read something about an affordable housing if you could, if you could wait till we have comments, that'd be great, and then you can make some comments. But is that an no, it's, it's, it's coming up shortly. Sorry. That's all. <laughs> Do you want me to review re review dates real quickly? Yeah, just very quickly, very briefly. Uh, yeah. Next week, September fifteenth, the plan commission will hear a presentation, much uh, like the council did at your last meeting. They will hear a report on the results of this recent survey. On Monday, uh, the 20th, the next city council meeting, the city council will consider the term sheet for the Settlers Green project. As Alderman Morsch mentioned, on Monday, October 4th, uh, we'll bring the housing plan back to you with modifications, with input from the Senior Resources mm -hmm. Commission and any, any other input we receive before that time. Um, and on October 13th, the plan commission is scheduled to consider the Settlers Green project. So that just lays out uh, the next 30 to 45 days. Um, some of these dates may change. We encourage you to um, watch the website uh, for those uh, at home who are watching. And, and, and please, if there's a way that, if there's comments that you didn't bring up that you want to get to me, please do that over the course of the next month. And uh, we'll make sure they get incorporated. I, I took a list of your thoughts and your questions here. I will make every attempt that before the next time we come back that we'll have uh, incorporated those things or addressed uh, those issues. I, I, I will say, um, you know, I will say that I, we are going to conduct, the Housing Trust feels very strongly about continuing uh, to move forward with affordable housing in Lake Forest. I guess what I'm hearing here is some uh, reservation on people's parts in terms of the entire program. I would, um, uh, I, I guess that would be a very serious reversal of policy at the city of Lake Forest. And if that was to uh, be something the council would like to consider, then I would like to make a very serious uh, discussion about that if we're going to take a reversal on this topic. Um, I think we want to move forward. We want to do that with everybody's input, with everybody's thoughts, uh, recognizing that this is probably not the easiest topic in the world, okay? Especially when it happens to be you know, when someone makes an issue about a project here or a project there. 
Um, up to this point, we have been very successful in moving forward. We have, uh, we have uh, uh, passed ordinances, we have set policy, we have raised funds through developments, not city funds, through development programs as, as these uh, developments have occurred. <clears throat> Uh, we come up with very thoughtful programs at Dara, for example, which I believe had 16 or 17 affordable units out of 120. Uh, they were going to be incorporated into the development. They were going to be mixed income. They were going to be both higher income and some moderate income. So there was a mix of incomes. All the things that I hear you talking about here were incorporated into that plan. So I think we've made a lot of good progress. We've done the right things in developments. Um, I would hate to have one project, which we weren't talking about tonight, be a lightning rod for certain uh, people, but um, if it is a lightning rod, it is. Um, I don't want us to lose the discussion. So we're committed to move forward. I want to do that with everybody's thoughts and input and, and design a program that makes the most sense for, for Lake Forest. And I really welcome your continued dialogue and your very thoughtful comments, each and every one of you. So thank you. Thank you, Alderman Morsh. Yeah. Our next item on the agenda this evening is uh, Legal Committee, Alderman Palmer. Uh, the Legal Committee did not meet, so I have no report. Okay. <coughs> the next item on the agenda is the <coughs> Senior Resources Commission, Alderman Novin. Yeah, just a uh, brief comment. Our next meeting is uh, Monday the 13th at 8 in the morning. Um, I'm sure that the affordable housing is going to be uh, a, the focus of the meeting. And, uh, you know, again, it's open, but that's our next uh, meeting. The last meeting, uh, we didn't have a quorum. So next city council meeting, I will have comments, but none right now. Okay. Thank you, Alderman Oden. The next item on the agenda is Public Works Committee, Alderman Luby. I just have two quick things. Uh, Ramesh has filled us in on just about everything. But the annual sidewalk and curb replacement and concrete street repair is underway. So if you're getting your sidewalk fixed out in front of your house or down the street, that will be taking place. And that is all supposed to be done by September 24th. And also for those of you that are out on the west side of town, uh, the Waukegan Road st streetscape and lighting project is uh, underway. They're gonna have the new custom poles go in and the new pedestrian push buttons to get across the street. Um, all of that work is scheduled to be completed by December 15th. So we're waiting for the, some of the polls and approval from IDOT on the little things, but you'll see trucks out there and activity going on as they get that work done. That's it for me. Thank you. The next item is uh, Transportation Safety Enhancement Committee, which I can report on. Uh, we met a last meeting on August 23rd. And uh, I think the main topic of that meeting really uh, focused on a video that the um, high school students worked on over the summer. It was part of our committee to ask the high school to uh, embark on creating their own video, kind of coming from them as to what they thought uh, they could get a message across for public safety, for pedestrian safety, and for railroad safety. And we saw a little sneak preview. I think it was, uh, what's it called? Transception? Transception, right? Uh, it was um, <laughs> remarkably well done. Uh, I can tell you it's not complete. We're hoping to see it rather soon, but I can tell you from what we witnessed, uh, I think this is going to be a YouTube <laughs> kit. I mean, yeah, they, they did a fabulous job. Uh, they spent uh, their own time on this over the summer. There was a professional. Uh, producer that worked on it, and uh, it was really quite a collaboration of the high school and some uh, college folks that worked on it. And I think uh, it did exactly what we were hoping for: is to get the uh, the high schoolers to kind of take this on their own as their project and get the message across to their own peer group that you know you need to be careful around the railroads and around safety and. And um, I think it's going to be fabulous when it comes out. So we're, we're waiting for that. And uh, we'll definitely, we'll, our, our thought was to actually have that shown here at the city council and have them present it to us when they finish it. So uh, that concludes my comments. And our next item on the agenda is any other comments by council members? Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to, on behalf of the third ward, thank uh, Mr. Kiley and his staff for fixing up Route 60. 
It looks great, and we hope to continue to beautify our beautiful Route 60. Thank you so much. And two quick comments. Just uh, this Saturday, Glossa's uh, 5K run is at uh, 6 o'clock. Entries are still open. Hopefully, there'll be a lot of aldermen, maybe some city managers out there running if they <laughs> choose to uh, 6 enter. Uh, 6 p.m. Oh. <laughs> um, and it's followed by a dinner for entrance and maybe some beer. Um, also, just uh, congratulations. It, it could be useful. Uh, but uh, Sunday of this last weekend, I wanted to compliment uh, uh, Susan Kelsey, who I saw out at the uh, Washington Circle Rib Fest, uh, judging, uh, going through the rain, and uh, helping determine which of the 10 entries were the winner. And uh, Kirby Henderson, with mole sauce on his ribs, took it this year, but it was a great turnout. Uh, great to be part of Lake Forest in a neighborhood. And uh, that's it. Thank you, sounds like a lot of fun. I've got a couple of things. <clears throat> uh, we've had uh, eight applicants for the uh, overhead sewer reimbursement program, two that have been approved for reimbursement. Sure. And um, uh, that this is the updates from Kathy. And the uh, election signs can now be displayed for the November mm -hmm. election. Reminder that signs cannot be located in the parkways. Uh, for election sign regulations, see the city's website. So. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, Kathy, just for an aside, how many signs are you allowed to display on one lot? It's on the website. It's in there. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this is Vic's favorite ordinance. Yeah, yes, it does. It does depend. There's, there's no limit as to the total number of signs but there are a limit of, of one per election contest, and there are limits as to size of the, uh, of the election signs themselves. Okay, thank you. When's early voting? October? It starts October 11th. Okay. It gets earlier every year. Any other comments, comments, no? Um, our next item on the agenda this evening is opportunity for public to address the city council on non-agenda items. Do you have a comment, you? Agenda items. I would like to talk about affordable housing. Is that on agenda or is that agenda? Well, I don't. Come on. I think it's permissible. If you want to come on up and state your information, address be here and, until uh, midnight. Make a comment. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you. I enjoyed your discussion tonight. Um, my name is Debbie Dent. I have no prepared comments. I had no idea I was getting up here. But <clears throat> I want to say thank you to all of you for back and forth discussion about affordable housing. And particularly thank you to Mr. Moore for raising, um, I consider myself in the trenches of Lake Foresters. I've been here, what, 14, 15 years. Um, when I say in the trenches is my husband and I worked very, very hard to afford, be able to afford to live here. And you know what? Now we're working even harder to be able to continue to afford to live here. Um, and those of us in the trenches, many, many, many people with whom I have spoken have said, why? It's a big question. Why are we spending so much time so much effort, so many resources on affordable housing. Um, I think it's wrong. I came, since from my, the time I was seven years old, I was doing charitable work, raising money. My brother, well, anyway, we don't have to get into that, but I'm very, I have a very kind heart and do a lot of charitable things. But I still, for many, many reasons, and I'm not prepared to speak about them now, many, many reasons I think it is wrong um, to have this agenda and time on affordable housing. Um, and I would like to know, I don't know who's on the housing trust, but it seems to me that the members of the housing trust already have that bent. They wanna push that agenda. Where is this, the person who speaks for people like me? And I can tell you hundreds or thousands of others. Where is that person? And can we get some input in a, on a committee basis? Or again, I don't know, even know if the housing trust is 
represented, but this is a very, very bad thing for many reasons. I'm not saying no affordable housing under any circumstances for anyone, but um, anyway, I just ask that you please put the brakes on this. Um, public housing in Lake Forest, I just, uh, there again, so uh, this is the first public housing project and I don't even think most of the population knows that it's a public housing project. And this is, this is dramatic. It's very, very dramatic. And it is something that, that we can't just have people who have their own agenda that's not what most of ours is pushing it. So I really ask that you give people like me, an opportunity to state our concerns in, uh, we don't have to be on the TV or whatever it is and speak out front. But uh, it, in other words, I'm happy to speak out front. I just was not prepared. I can give you a laundry list of why it's bad. You know, one thing, this thing about forcing developers, I don't think it's so great to say, oh, well, it's, it's private funds. We're forcing developers. Those are private funds. Those are people. If you look in Wisconsin, for example, uh, I have a, re a neighbor who used to live there, and in Wisconsin, they said that every one of those developments where they forced affordable housing in there had failed completely. I mean, things like that that we really need to look at and we really have to have competing thoughts. And if after competing thoughts and I, a survey or whatever, we come to the conclusion that the, half the town should be affordable housing, terrific. But we need to have a discussion, and I'm, I've never heard the great discussion like I heard tonight. I've been to many of these meetings over the years, so I thank you very much for having the discussion. Thank you for your comments. Is, is there a survey? I've seen something about an affordable housing survey. And who, to whom did that go? I went out to residents and employees, and it was available on the city's website. It didn't go to this resident, okay. is that? Is, it, it was done, when was it done, Kathy, a couple months ago? So maybe you missed it or, right? Yeah, I look for everything very carefully on this subject okay. and I haven't heard any of my friends who have such a survey. They all said, what survey? Okay. So um, could somebody address who's gotten it, what form we, it was in? We can in? certainly give you all the results to it, for sure. So Right, yeah. but I mean, if, if it wasn't, in fact, if it wasn't distributed to most people, Nobody I've asked has, has seen it. Um, so if most of us missed it, could we then have an opportunity to redo the survey? That's what I'm asking. I mean, you have to have some, that's, that's my request. I don't know the answer to that. I'd have, I'd have to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Any other public on non-agenda items? Yes, sir. Well, we're hoping to. If you want to speak to the same, we'll take it quickly if you have. We might have a number of people who want to talk about affordable housing. Mm -hmm. so. Oh. You're going to get comments. Thanks. My name is, is Dennis Smallman's. I live at 1100 Sir William Lane, uh, and there's been a lot of discussion these last two meetings about where the market is and what it means, and I know there was some information shared at the last meeting around the assessed values in Lake Forest that was dated, uh, and I'm certain that my assessment's going to be challenged this year, as will probably most everybody else in Lake Forest. Uh, unless there's a significant movement. Um, as of August 30th, I looked at the real estate listings available in Lake, Lake Forest, Lake Bluff, and uh, I think at the last meeting, 300,000 was kind of a magic number for what constituted affordable, and this is what information came up in that. Uh, as of August 30th, we've got about 6.6% uh, of the housing in Lake Forest that would, quote, be under that definition affordable. And I know that there's an interagency um, document that's part of the affordable housing that encourages 
the housing trust to work with other communities. Um, they've got Highwood and Highland Park and I think Deerfield, but nothing about Lake Bluff. And when I think about Lake Forest, it's kind of like Lake Forest, Lake Bluff is one community. So I put that on here to kind of look at the broader community and I guess I would encourage the Housing Trust and the City Council to think about this question, not in terms of what's in the geographic city limits of Lake Forest, but what's in the broader community and reasonable commuting distance to Lake Forest as being affordable housing. Now I know that um, Alderman Morsch mentioned that there were six properties that would probably be the equivalent of the seven single family housing properties that are so noted here in Lake Forest. I can tell you three of them are below $200,000. So affordable housing uh, is certainly when you look at at least that price point and the relative geography reasonable. Now I sat in the last meeting and I heard the mayor suggest that you go back to the beginning and look at it. So I went back to the beginning and I looked at the document that was uh, the first resolution to support and encourage the development of affordable housing. And when you look at all the whereases, the key whereas is that I can see is the average sales price for a home in Lake Forest in 2003 was $1,061,000, which was a 65% increase from 94 and an 11% increase from 2002. I went to uh, Tru Trulia, some real estate website, I said, I want to see what the average housing price, sales price in Lake Forest is. And lo and behold, from June to August of 2010, the average selling price was $849,000 in Lake Forest. If I expanded that to the 60045 area, it was $848,000. If I looked at the quarter before, which was the only information that was available, the number was 620. So if you look at the last six months, I didn't, they didn't give me stats and said there were 20 in one period and 30 in another. That average would suggest we're at about 735 is the average. Now, my real estate broker friends tell me the top end of the market is dead. This represents sales, which is probably representing the lower end of the market. But if you look at market conditions today, that whereas, which was a big driver for this whole development, of a million dollars average selling price, when interest rates were probably around 7% for 30 year money, you can go to Lake Forest Bank today and get 30 year money for 4% with one point. So a lot of the, the, a lot of the fact base that drove the original resolutions aren't really valid right now. And I think if you go back to point zero, and say, what can we do to support some of the elderly? Maybe we take some of that money and we offer grants, or we offer money to help buy down mortgages. You know, it wouldn't take a whole lot of money to make it feasible for somebody to stay here. And I didn't know tonight what the demolition fee was, $10,000 for a developer here. Unfortunately, you probably missed the boat. You probably could have charged 100. You know, you could have had a bigger asset base had you thought about it a little bit more and thought about the future. I, don't th I think Barra, if that ever goes, is going to be the biggest development you're going to have in this town. You're never going to see big developments like that. You have to think about individual properties and how can you protect them and how can you retain that housing stock. Put a huge penalty on demolition of low priced properties. Maybe it's an inverse sliding scale that says if the property is under $300,000, it's a $150,000 demolition fee. If it's a million dollars, it's a $10,000 fee. You can become more creative to build an asset base where you can give some grants and not think about being a carpenter with a hammer and nails and building buildings. I, I then did one last thing today and I went to the uh, Illinois Affordable Housing website and I said, what are the conditions for this money we've gotten? We got it under a grant that we have to build something. 
but there are four other ways you can get money from them. You can do ownership programs where you subsidize people to get into housing. You can do home repair and modification programs. And I am sure there are a lot of low-income housing projects or low-income targets here that would qualify in Lake Forest. And you can do ongoing affordable housing initiatives. There are other ways to use this money, and maybe the thing to do is to go back to the, to the state and say, we're thinking differently about this. We think we could do something that supports the real estate market in Lake Forest and become a little bit more creative about it. Those are my comments. Thank you for your comments. Any other uh, individuals would like to make a comment this evening? No. Our next item on the agenda is the uh, consent agenda. We have two items on the agenda this evening. Uh, I'll just read them both and then ask for the council to uh, make a recommendation as to how they want to approve them. Number one is approval of authorized invoices and payrolls. Uh, and the second is the authorization of Trevor's warrants to meet the expenses of September 2010. Motion to approve. Second. And roll call. Alderman Grumhouse. Aye. Alderman Novick. Aye. Alderman Whitman. Aye. Alderman Moore. Aye. Alderman Norsh. Aye. Alderman Hanrahan. Aye. Alderman Luby. Aye. Alderman Palmer. Aye. Eight yeas, no nays, the motion carries. Thank you, Beth. Our next item on the agenda this evening is new business, and our first item is Adopt the Park Program, presented by Dan Reeves, Superintendent of Parks, Forestry, and Golf Operations. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Cowie, members of council. It's nice to be in front of you again. You know, I'm here to talk about the Adopt the Park Program. It's really a pretty simple program. It's designed to uh, allow neighborhoods, businesses, organizations, and residents an opportunity to participate in the maintenance of the parks in their neighborhoods. Um, one thing this program is not designed to do is to change the character of a park. I'd like to see them all kind of remain the same. We surveyed 25 communities. Um, most of the communities we surveyed weren't big proponents of the program. They said they didn't see a lot of a lot of major um, adoption of major parts of their parks. They thought the thing they saw the most of was litter control, some painting, um, some bike trail and trail maintenance. Um, we think that there's a different clientele in Lake Forest and we know some people who are already interested in the program that we think will make our program a lot more successful than what we've seen from the communities that we've talked to. Um, the way we we thought this would work was that staff would approve the simple, um, the simple adoptions such as litter pickup, trail control, um, some painting. But if we had some major improvements that were amenities or um, or shelters or new playgrounds, they would go back to the park board, um, possibly come back to city council. So as the the approval process would work, is the staff would take the the low-hanging fruit, the easy things, and the tougher things that would come back to the park board would be amenities like playgrounds and, and, and tennis courts. And if there's something new being added to the park, somebody wanted to add a tennis court or add a, a playground that wasn't already existing, that would require us to maintain it in the future, we would come back to council and, and go through the adoption program with that in mind. Um, so we were thinking that um, it, it's not really the answer to the funding program, the funding problem that the rec center has, but it's certainly a tool in the toolbox. And um, since we have people that we think are willing to participate in the program, it doesn't cost us anything to do it. And we've got nothing to do but gain. Um, we're here hoping you'd approve the new policy to let us try this program out. Any two questions for Dan? Yeah, I have a question first. I'm beginning to see an awful lot of signs around Lake Forest, ones at the beach, there's more than ever. And we talked about doing this, you know, earlier banners were, you know, commented on, you say you're gonna put a sign up of appreciation and who's doing it. Do we have any samples of what you're doing or what the sizes are? I mean, I hate to see, you know, 
like these places where every tree's got a big plaque in front of it and every bench has a, a we already have signs on the benches but do you have samples of what we're looking at that we're going to be approving here that will be going up um, we don't I could I could tell you the average size from other communities that we surveyed was just a you know a six by ten inch sign right. and what are we going to do um, I, would, I would say we'd probably stay I mean, with the average you know yeah. depending on what you're giving it kind of goes with well that's rights. what I mean we, we kind of need to know though so if they give a lot how big a sign they get a billboard are we the approvers or yeah you would have it would be line? coming back to you if uh, let's say well, we'd, we'd uh, have to Luby approve family. that somebody's going to be giving something and their name is going to go But on. at that time, the recognition would be included in the full package that would be but, coming back okay. to you. But if someone wants to do litter control and we're going to give them a sign, we wouldn't approve that. It would go straight to parks. But I think um, the staff's well, position is the same, same as yours, Alderman Luby, in terms of we've got this proliferation of signage now. Uh, that's why out at Deer Path Golf Course now, what we've done is the giving tree. So rather than post every tree, right. there's a, a board inside. We've done that recently at the Senior Center. We did right. that with Market Square. That's the direction we're going rather than naming everything in particular. Well, that's, that's what I want to see out in front of Deer Path Golf Course now that we have you know, restaurant, driving range, golf rental, pro shop, whatever else. I mean, you know, suddenly we have five signs out in front of there. So we look at these highway adopt the highway signs right. and I don't have a real problem, but I just want to make sure that we have something that's kind of standardized when people come in that they know the size of the sign they're going to get for what they're given. So, with, you know, we don't get that. Well, I want, you know, the comment was you get a banner in the, in the park, and I, I don't want to see a banner behind home plate here and somebody else on another one on yeah. the soccer goal and things. I just think we need to have it tied down right now with kind of the, the sizes and what they are and what they're going to look like so it's standardized like the brass plaque on the benches at the beach we know exactly what it is we know that it's not too big mm -hmm. and and what it is before we go out and approve them all so i think the program's great but i just think we got to tie down what the recognition is like we've done those giving trees and gordon has theirs sure. and whatever I, mean, I, I would agree with this I, you know i think this is a novel idea i think it's it is similar to the naming rights you know, I touched on a little bit earlier in the committee of the whole, but when, you know, the ad hoc park and rec committee looked at this, I think what we wanted to do is really use this as an opportunity to get a lot of, you know, for really big projects and, and be willing to give up recognition for that. So if someone, you know, adopts an entire park or agrees to do the maintenance on an entire product park, or, you know, there's a substantial monetary um, benefit to the city and to the, the park for that you know we need to recognize that we need to go against our general aversion to signage and stuff like that and and you know that's fine but I think what we do want to get a we want to avoid whether it's naming rights or whether it's this is just to have a science all over the place right. you know every golf hole has a sign or every you know backstop has a sign or you know I just don't think it's worth it. You know, I mean, it, it's great if someone wants to come in and, you know, do the mowing or plant something. They can do it, but I don't think we need to do a sign. Maybe we can do a page in the back of the, the rec book that says, you know, thank you to these sponsors who, you know, did these certain things. But I, I want to get away. I think all of us are uncomfortable with having, you know, little services that people do and then feeling like we have to have a name sign somewhere because we are over signed. I think it will turn people off. Um, and, you know, again, I'm fine with it if, if it's for big commitments where people are really, uh, you know, doing stuff above and beyond, um, you know, especially on a monetary basis. But, you know, for the little things, I think we should try and find different ways to recognize them if we're going to do this. David, I, I don't know if it, it would be as a big a, a, an issue as you might think because we do have right now um, a number of very generous benefactors that are anonymous. They, they simply have asked for nothing. You know, they, they're giving money out of their own kindness and they're not looking for the recognition. So, you know, I, I, I'm not sure it's going to be as big an issue as we think. I, and I, I agree with you. We don't want signs all over the place and pepper it and make I, it commercial. But when I, I read we these, can, we can certainly craft right. it. So when I read these things, though, it, the expectation seems to be that we'll do a sign for everyone who adopts well, anything. And, well, thank and, you. you know, yeah, and, and you know, I don't want to see all, every auto park up there. I, I know when I went to the 
Fourth of July event, we had wonderful sponsors and we gave them signs, which we should do. Yeah. But I don't want a one-time event, though. It's, you know, well, but I if it's a one-time event, I'm, I'm going to pay for the, you know, the baseball field for the year and all the maintenance because I sell sporting goods and I want to put my sign up there. I, I just want to make sure that we have it so that we know where we're at and what it is before it goes out to people to, you know, get their name out in front of everything. We plan to meet with every adoptive park person. Right. Who who but we still need to, to standardize something. it up front. So and maybe what we do is, is we meet them, and if it's something as simple as picking up litter or painting something, we don't offer a sign. Yeah, that's, maybe that's we take that out. Yeah. But if it's somebody who wants to, let's say, maintain Elowa Park completely, uh, maybe we say, you know what, well, we give them a little bigger sign if they want to sign. The person may not want to sign. But if it's something that's going to give us substantial money, maybe we bend the rules and try to put in something that For example, is, them. is the Lake Forest Baseball Association complained about South Park, is if they want to redo all the baseball fields and the grass and everything, I think we, you know, we look at doing signs of LFBA if they want to do that. I agree. I'd, I'd like to commend Superintendent Reeves for this idea with no downside really, except for maybe a problem with signs. <laughs> no cost and a, and a potential upside. And I, yeah. and I had a question, if I could, for, uh, for you. you. Who, because I've heard a couple different answers up here, who approves signs, like a sign on a park or a sign on a golf course? In HPC, we had to approve signs in the historic areas. We approved it or didn't approve the signs for Macy's and for the college, and that was where we were. But it didn't matter who the sign was for. It was gonna. It had to be approved by HPC because it was in a historic area. Who who would approve signs for the golf course or a park or? Well, we it? have the sign ordinance in place, and so if it's whatever is dictated by the sign ordinance, whether it's the director of community development or um, the director of parks and recreation, it's really set forth there. There are times, though, that there is some discretion that is permitted, and so we'll talk at a staff level and say. Do we have a problem with this? Do we have a problem with that? We have seen like recently with like the Burmache signs that originally it was just at Christmas time from sad organization. Well, then it went from sad to uh, also 4th of July and Rotary and a couple of other things. Everybody wanted to start using the Burmache signs. It was signs, prom. So. prom. Rotary never prom. did it. Okay. It was prom. Rotary, Rotary asked, but we it. said no, I think. <laughs> yeah. uh, but there, then, you know, it sort of starts to feed on itself. And so one of the things that we talked about was bringing back a few of those kinds of things to actually it's the building review board that would have signs outside or throughout the whole community, not just the uh, Historic Preservation District for their review and their consideration if we want to update the sign ordinance. So BRB unless people decide it isn't BRB or? We'll see, but not every sign it would be covered because again, if it's permitted under the current code, we would go ahead and we would approve it. And we made some changes to the sign ordinance a year ago, mm -hmm. maybe nine months ago you were, uh, you to try and update it. And so those, they can just come in, get a permit for, Kathy will review it, make sure it's in compliance with the uh, code, and then we issue a permit. Okay, so community, then there's a, a petition that happens in community development for every sign, and then some of them go to BRB and some go to HPC, depending on whether they're historic or not? Uh, no, whether they meet with the code or not. If they're outside of the code, not permitted under the code, then they would be required to go, so. If they want an exception. But you get, you get all the, you decide whether they go to BRB or HPC or get approved no, the, right there. There's a, there's a sign All signs require a permit. Right. Which so requires we receive, an application, which requires an approval. Under the requirement. We receive an application. Uh, we review it. If it's consistent with the sign ordinance, we can issue the permit directly, which okay. was a recent change we made. Um, for instance, the round city signs mm -hmm. that you see at the parking lots, that uh, several years ago, uh, Rosie Hawk brought that before the Building Review Board. and. Uh, that standard sign was approved for all city parks, city parking lots. Um, so as Bob said, it, it depends. If it's something specifically called out and permitted in the ordinance, we issue a permit and we just do it administratively. Otherwise, it would go before BRB if it's outside the historic district or to the HPC. Uh, for instance, we recently took um, a directory sign for the central business district to the Historic Preservation Commission, something Susan Kelsey's working on. But those are big signs. Signs at the parks for a garden, you're not gonna be. 
Could we think in the alternative, maybe there's things that we could do aside from signs. You know, we have a city website. Plausibly, we could post people's names and recognize them on the city website. Uh, maybe we could do it on public access TV. We've got a lot of signs in the park. Right. Uh, we're going to be putting them up, taking them down on a yearly basis. I'm sure legal committee will have some liability issue with signs in the areas they're posted after a certain point. I, I'm with David. I don't think we have to clutter up every portion of the town. Maybe that's something good about Lake Forest that's as a whole. I, that's why I start the process. If it comes from four directions yeah. and there's not a gatekeeper, well, so to speak, then it's going to get messy. That was my point, just to make sure that we have it down before we take any applications. So I think it needs to go back to your group and take a look at that so that you have something standardized for what it's going to be and kind of the monetary amount. And, you know, is it on the website? Is it in the city, you know, directory? Is it the website, thank you for our donors, the giving tree, you know, wherever it is. And I'd like to get a banner right here in front or some flowers. <laughs> yeah. We'll polish the desk yeah. here. Well, <laughs> let, me make, let me make a suggestion because what the conversation I'm hearing tonight goes way beyond this adoptive a park program. It sounds like it. <laughs> and so I would strongly suggest that you know, if the council is comfortable with this, we can go forward with this, hearing what your conversation was, and we're not going to, you know, give away signs uh, easily. But I think staff working with the um, Park and Rec Board, as well as Building Review Board and possibly the HPC, and have to the, sort of uh, revisit committee. this much broader discussion because there's a lot of signage out there right now. So then you also get into, do we start taking all those signs down? Uh, I mean, you can walk through any park in the city right now. You can go out to Deer Path Golf Course, and there are a lot of names on trees and so forth. Right. So are we going to grandfather them? Or are we going to take them down? I mean, there's a whole can of worms out there. I, I, I but, but, I'm but, saying pass this, but before you start signing up a lot more, make sure that you have the policy. Absolutely. Place, that's all. And, and I think we have, but I think my point is, is that whatever the policy is for this has to be in policy for a lot of other things that don't fall under the adopt a park program. Because if I want to donate a tree, that's not in this. That's not covered by this per se. But I might want to. I want to. No, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I looked uh, at the list. But there, it would go beyond yeah, that. I, I was going to make a point of trying to clarify that issue because it's great when it's related to the parks here. If those of you who are on the council remember our long discussion about Townline Park and not having people's names right. on right. parks and buildings and other city assets, and I'm very much against that. Still. I'm okay to put the signs. I think they've done a great job at the Senior Center and other places where they recognize the people who have given, and I think that should be conserved. Well, I would suggest we get a recommendation on the concept of Adopt a Park program and then work out, obviously, how the signage issue. See, it is in here, though. Plants, out. perennials, trees. Work out a recognition. Right. And then but I'm just saying, for example, I could give, I could donate a park signs, or a tree or? to City Hall here. And they could put a tree right outside well, City Hall, and then I'd say I want a big plaque, uh, Bob Kiley, with it. So what I'm saying is this goes way beyond just the adopt a part program that we're talking about, and the staff is talking well, I, about. I so. agree with that. Yeah. And we right. just have to be consistent. Something wherever across we're at. the board. That's why I'm That's saying. Right. Yeah. Dan, I have a question about the concept. I want to get back to the concept. Uh, clearly, we want resident buy-in and resident commitment and the city wants to be able to rely on these residents who say that, yeah, I'm going to take care of that park and I'm going to clean up this one. And you've got this written up in the terms of an agreement, but what if the resident doesn't do what they're supposed to do? We're not going to get heavy handed with these people. We're just going to, I mean, so I, it's just a real kind of soft kind of agreement, I guess, okay? It is, and if they decide after two months that they don't want to pick up litter anymore in the park, then we send our guys over to pick up the litter in the park. Um, it's not okay. like we're going to try to force somebody to pick up the litter in the park, or you know, it's try, it's trying to get people help who want to help. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, they're going to have to earn it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, relative to the sensitivity of signs, and I'd like to, if it's okay, make a motion to. Uh, Pass the adopt the park program. Second. So, uh, roll call vote, please. Alderman Grimhouse. Aye. Alderman Novit. Aye. Alderman Widman. 
Aye. Alderman Moore? Aye. Alderman Morsh? Aye. Alderman Hanrahan? Aye. Alderman Luby? Aye. Alderman Palmer? Aye. Eight yeas, no nays, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thanks, Thanks Dan. Our next item of the agenda this evening is uh, award of a bid for the Recreation Center Fitness Locker Room HVAC Replacement Project. So included in the fiscal year 2010 bond issuance budget presented by Michael Thomas, Superintendent of Public Works. I apologize for the, the long title of the agenda item, uh, but it gives you a very good description. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. This evening, staff is requesting City Council approval for one of our many projects included in this current fiscal year's capital improvement program. Uh, over at the rec center locker room, the HVAC and dehumidification systems, which currently are two separate systems, have caused us a lot of he headaches and a lot of repairs over the years to a point where the dehumidification system has been disconnected uh, for well over a year. The company that has supplied parts uh, has gone out of business. So knowing this uh, last year while we were planning our budget, we included in this current fiscal year's uh, CIP program. Went out to bid, we have the results for you this evening. We're recommending a low bid. Uh, if you have any further questions, I'd be happy to answer. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Second. Uh, Mike, Mike is, is, is this uh, um, camp of contest program is a system? Do we have information whether this is a good system? It's a quality system? Yes. It's a well-performing system? It, the the uh, engineer that designed this for us up in Wisconsin knows this firm and company, and yes, we checked the references. Okay. We checked references with people that have used the system, and to answer your question, okay. yes. Uh, roll call vote, sure. please. Alderman Grumham? Aye. Alderman Novit? Aye. Alderman Whitman? Aye. Alderman Moore? Aye. Alderman Morse? Aye. Alderman Hanrahan? Aye. Alderman Luby? Aye. Alderman Palmer? Aye. Eight yeas, no nays, the motion carries. Thank you, Beth. Our next item on the agenda this evening is a word of a bid for the Northcroft Park Pavilion and South Beach Pavilion roof replacement project included in the fiscal year 2010 bond issuance budget. Again, Michael Thomas will present. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, again, uh, these two roofs were included in the current fiscal year's capital improvement program. Every four to five years, we have a private company on McHenry, IRCA, do an evaluation of all the roofs on the city-owned buildings. Uh, they performed that, I believe, in 2008. Uh, at that time, they noted that these roofs were deficient at that point, and for a lack of a better term, they, we had to get those in line and wait for other roofs to be completed and other projects. So uh, these two roofs uh, are in our capital planning uh, and do need to be replaced. As far as the beach, uh, we have done the other two roofs the previous two years. We did the, the North Pavilion and we did the Boat Pavilion last year. We will finish with this uh, pavilion uh, and then Northcroft Park Again, the analysis head that was the same. These are replacing the original roofs, uh, again, with the material that was uh, approved uh, originally by Northcroft BRB down at the beach, uh, the HPC. Uh, so do you have any questions? I'd be yeah, I mean, the bid, obviously, for Cedar Roofing Company is significantly lower than the others. Have we done any business with them? or uh, We have, yes, and actually uh, the consultant that we've been working with, IRCA, has done a good amount of work with them as well. Uh, they, they do a good amount of work in town. They're a very reputable company, and uh, they're, they're eager. Uh, and so we're very happy to see the, see the good prices. At the beach, uh, South Pavilion, part of that is the North Shore Sanitary District pumping station. Do they pay for any of that building? Uh, that's a very good question. I don't know the answer to that. I, I am not sure if they do or not. Uh, I don't know if. Yeah, I don't have an answer. That is a good question. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we that will be. Yeah, it's like at least half or more. Yeah, they, they have a lot of that building. Yeah. Actually, they took a lot of that building with that. Yeah, that's where all the pumps are Pumps. inside there. Correct. Does this yeah, so that it does. Yes, it does. It's it's the entire entire roof. It of is. I saw it last night. So yes. I would. Uh, Recommend that we, you know, well, talk to them. Table the beach, uh, let's go with Northcroft, and we'll come back to you at your 20th meeting with an answer to your question. Yeah. But that's a good okay. So I'll make the motion for the okay. for the other one right now. Second. Are we? Wait, you're on number four now. Then. Well, do you want do you want to just well, do yeah. you want to just approve it? Subject. I mean, it's not. We're going to have to do it. 
Well, we don't know. Uh, well, the amount would be different. About four the amount. Of the roll call <laughs> amount has to we can't well, do four unless we do three. Here would be an option. Uh, I'll throw out to the council. What if we approve them yeah, subject to the chairman of the Public Works Committee and chairman of the Finance Committee once we get an answer to the question and then we can just report back to the council at the next meeting what we learned and, and whether the two chairmen and the two committees said okay. Um, we have to have some sort of contract with North Shore, right? Well, that's, that's what I'm thinking is that we have some kind of a lease arrangement on that building, but I, right off the top of my head, I don't know what that is. I mean, we may be responsible for it, depending if they're paying us money. It would seem to me that if the work needs to be done, approving it is probably the thing to do. The lease is going to govern how the costs are apportioned. Right. right. I think that's a good solution. Come back to John. Yeah. So we'll just, yeah. If we, if we save money, we'll let you know. If not, but the motion's to approve. Okay. Okay. Second. To approve for both. For both. Both. Okay. Okay. Second. Uh, we have a, a roll call vote, please. Alderman Grumhouse? Aye. Alderman Novit? Aye. Alderman Widman? Aye. Alderman Moore? Aye. Alderman Morse? Aye. Alderman Hanrahan? Aye. Alderman Luby? Aye. Alderman Palmer? Aye. Eight yeas, no nays, the motion carries. <clears throat> Are we going to take number four then? Are we? Or did you just do four? We did it. No. No, no, no we got three. Four. Four. No, no, three. Got three. I have a question three. about four. Two two pieces. Pieces. Uh, I mean, you're basically almost doubling the work on four. Why wouldn't you just do a rebid for a whole set of new cedar roofs? Uh, Combining three and four together with greater volume. Good question. I, 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 Alderman Morris, I, I think we believe that the prices were that good that we went back to CRC and said, would you uh, assume the same price if we went ahead with How about these two would they roofs do it at the for golf course? Per square foot? You don't know that. Correct. So. That's an awfully good price. Mm -hmm. We will tell you it was, and and we are we're simply bringing it to your attention. We, we we believe it's an opportunity. If not, we can definitely wait till next fiscal year and uh, go out to bid as it's as it's planned in the CIP. Uh, we just thought it was a good price and should at least bring it to your attention to say between the savings with with the HVAC over at the rec center and the savings on these two roofs, we can go ahead and pay for the two roofs at the golf course. Don't have to, but we, we thought it was a good number. Well, what about if the order, if, the, if our action was lay the bidding process and authorize it for a price not to exceed 76.3, but you try to get something better? Sure, sure. I, we can absolutely. I, I don't we, feel that much luck because it sounds like they've already talked to them about it and they've seen the public bidding and know that they won the bid by. Yeah, they may be listening right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sharpen their pencils. <laughs> Well, I, have, I have a question. Low, oh, lower sorry. than the other two. Does this, when we did $7.13 a square foot, mm -hmm. a square is 100 square foot, right? Correct. We, 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 on this analysis, we simply looked at the square footage of the roof and divided into their, their price. And so is this, it was, a, this is a tear off? Uh, correct. Not? It is and a complete, complete tear off. Redo. Okay, correct. Correct. Because that, that was the cost of slate when we were looking at the cost of putting roofs on things. That, you know, I mean, it was a, that's a lot of money, seven dollars yeah. a foot. But that's taking off the old roof. Yes. Mm -hmm. Look at, it, look at the other bit. Yeah. The last. I know. One. I know. Yeah. I, you know, I had, I know we when we we had shown in the bidding. Or I had seen a memo that we'd also asked about bidding with a different material asphalt. for the roof for an asphalt, and I understand why that's not a good option on the Northcroft and on the beach parks. And I can even see it for the clubhouse here. You know, I want to ask the question on the, the cart barn. Is there a reason to consider doing asphalt there? I mean, you really don't. See I don't it. go to I don't go to Deer Path very often. I haven't been to Deer Path in you know a couple months. But my recollection is that cart barn is pretty much back in the woods. It holds carts. People don't really go in it. Um, you know, I don't think you can see it much even from the you parking really don't lot, see right? It at all. Well, um, I'd actually probably ask Kathy and the Building Review Board to take a look at it because they approved it in the first place. And um, actually, you can if you're back on the course and you're looking back. The buildings are actually right next to each other, yeah. um, so I would be uncomfortable about making that decision okay. here this evening. I hear what you're saying. I think if you were going to do asphalt, you'd put it on both buildings, not one or the other. So, is that? Yeah, they're just separated by a sidewalk, right? If I remember. Right. Mm -hmm. Isn't the car What's the savings the with asphalt? 
Uh, we did not. Uh, it was seventeen thousand dollars on Northcroft. Uh, we did not bid out asphalt down at the beach because all the other pavilions that we had completed right. in the two to three fiscal years prior were cedar shake, so we did not option it out. We, we simply optioned out asphalt in case we were to come over budget. We wanted to be able to come to you and say we can meet budget, but we've got to go with the asphalt shingles. Um, that really was the purpose of, of putting the asphalt shingle request into the bid. Um, so Michael, what is the status of the roof at Deer Path Golf Course? Not not the cart farm, but the clubhouse itself. Is that going to have to be replaced within yes, the both, next year? Yes, both, or two? both uh, the clubhouse and the cart barn are scheduled in FY 2012, so next fiscal year. But uh, I'm sorry, so this is just to do the barn, not the clubhouse? No, no it's to do both. It's to do both. And both, both are scheduled to, to, to occur next fiscal year. We simply wanted to bring it to council and say, we've got a good price, would you like to go now? If not, we can we I mean, can if the council more. wants us to bid out, because I think the issue would be doing one and not the other. I guess if we want to do both, we could take it back to the building review board. I, I wouldn't do see. both. I mean, you know, I, I, I think the building review board is not going to want you to do asphalt on the, on the main clubhouse. Mm -hmm. So, no, I think you have to go with it. All right, I just want to raise it. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve. I think Second. we should go ahead and do it. We've raised the bond funds. You know, we're under budget on all this stuff, so we're basically doing a two for one, and I think it is a very good price. You wouldn't be looking at that much of a savings overall, would you? It would be savings in the bond. Um, right, but between the two, the life expectancy is about the same on them, and the, it's going to look better, and the, overall there's not that much savings, and you, you would be making two buildings different, which we'd never allow a okay. building review that, anyway. So, yeah, I'm seconding the motion. Okay. Uh, roll call vote, please. Alderman Grumhouse. Aye. Alderman Novit. Aye. Alderman Widman. Aye. Alderman Moore. Aye. Alderman Morsh. Aye. Alderman Hanrahan. Aye. Alderman Luby. Aye. Alderman Palmer. Aye. Eight Thank yeays, no nays, the motion carries. Any additional items for council discussion? Hearing none, uh, motion, motion, motion for adjournment. Oh. Cool. Could I hand out the recycling survey results? Oh, motion to adjourn. <laughs> we, uh, I will pass out to you uh, a copy of the results from the recycling survey. Uh, it was out for exactly one month. Uh, happy to report we had 51% response. Uh, we sent That's out, I, oh I've been God. looking at the numbers so much that I, uh, again, these were only to those people that we collect refuse at, single family, residential, but we sent out 6,559, we had 3,366 responses. Uh, so what I'll give you is a binder that has the results citywide, average, and then I have got it broken down by ward, and then all of the comments by ward. So I'd like to give it to you this evening. We're going to discuss it at the uh, 20th at the finance meeting. Um, I wish there was a clear direction uh, when I write the report, and when we look at that one question that says, would you support a cart or a bin, 53 say cart, 47 say no thanks and the opinions are strong on both sides. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to, to go through the data and like get the information. Uh, council <laughs> <laughs> Can we so please not bring it forward? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Real All clear. Aye. 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 Aye.